Before I continue here, let me comment uh, on something someone asked me during the break. Where's Dr. Jared? I know that's your first name. Where, where are you? There he is, right back there, one of the, one of the back row sitters back there. Uh, Dr. Jared asked me to uh, com complete a thought, not a part of this program, but I want to complete this thought anyway. Uh, in talking about alternatives of care, did any of the rest of you have the same question? So what do you do? You're supposed to talk about alternatives of care with patients, but you're saying maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Well, yes, you are required to talk to patients about alternative treatment. The only thing is your timing is lousy. They say, whoo, or they fold their arms and you jump to treatment plan number two, alternative number two. And they say, oh, I bet that's still going to cost me. And you jump to treatment plan number three. So what do you do instead? This is what Dr. Jared was asking me. What do you do instead? I believe the first thing we should think about is what, what do we envision for the patient? My vision for the patient is their life will never be the same. When they say, can you help me? I say, yes, we can, yes. And I have no idea what they need. <laughs> So I want to have a pre, kind of a preconceived idea about I want this patient's life to be changed as a result of what we have the opportunity to do for them. And do, does their life get changed if they go down that little sliding path down to doing the least expensive thing? Or just what insurance covers? Is that life-changing care? Well, maybe, maybe not. Most of the time, based on the complex nature of the care I've worked in, in the field providing and helping with, over the last several years. We can do better than we've done. A patient taught me this. She came to the office, she had her hand clasped against her face. When I asked her, you know, since I was assisting, in order to do the evaluation, we'll need to see your teeth. She moved her hand, still couldn't see her teeth because she had her lips wrapped around her teeth. I said, in order to do the evaluation, we'll need to see your teeth. When I saw her teeth, I gasped. It was the worst case I'd ever seen. She had black teeth, she had foaming gums, she had apple core cavities, the mesial and distal cut out of every single tooth around both arches. I said, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, and I better double glove. I mean, this is bad. But I'll never forget when the doctor did the evaluation and asked me to seat the patient in the talking area. And he went in, he said, have you seen pictures of your teeth like this? She said, yeah, it's bad, isn't it? He said, I see a lot of good things. And I'm thinking, like what? I'm standing in the hall listening because I want to hear what's he going to say to this one because it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. And I'll never forget, he said, look this area right here, this is your sinus and it's clear, that's good. I'm thinking, if that's all she's got, okay, go for it. <laughs> but it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. Then he said, look at this bone. In spite of the fact that you have periodontal disease, you still have bone. You're here just in time <laughs> before you've lost too much. And he gave her a little lesson on loss and, and said, I'm so glad you're here. You're here just in time. He said, look at these root tips. What you see is not looking too good, but what I see is a foundation we can build on that. So glad you're here. We can help you. And I stood in the hall as this lady turned to him and said, in her language, you know, I've I seen five doctors before I come here. They all told me all my teeth had to go. But I figured that since they could put man on the moon, they ought to be able to put teeth back in my mouth. <laughs> and so I figured, as I stood in the hall, obviously there are a lot of dentists in this world that don't know we can put man on the moon. So they just take a partial trip. And I wasn't talking about the prosthetic device. I'm talking about our habits of going down that other little path when someone folds their arms or says, whoo, I bet that's going to cost me. And we just jump to treatment plan number two, treatment plan number three, treatment plan number four, treatment plan number 37, until they just say yes to something. And so I started analyzing, how can we stop that habit? When a patient says, whoo, there's no way I can do that, I just figure they can't do it today. Imagine that. How many of you have wanted something you couldn't buy today? but tomorrow might be a better day. How many of you have ever been broke? Some of you might be there right now. But tomorrow might just be a better day. I mean, I've been broke. Disney took bankruptcy five times, so hey, I can do it. You know, I can handle it. The reality is we get what we get. These patients come in with high expectations and we take their expectations and dilute it down into if your insurance will cover it. Let's find out. 
so you can be more disappointed and end up like your mama. My mother went to the dentist at, uh, well, she worked in the dental office, and she called me one day at age 65. She said, what should I do? I broke a tooth off even with a gum. I said, get it fixed. You work for the dentist. She said, they looked at it, said it's just a root tip. They want to roll it out. And since I don't have that many remaining teeth, they want to take out the rest of my teeth and give me a denture. And I don't want a denture. Your daddy's a clacker. <laughs> my daddy went to the dentist at age 18. He said, I've got bad teeth. My mama had bad teeth. My mama's mama had bad teeth. My mama's 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 107 had bad teeth. You might as well take these teeth out. My mama's had, had hers out, and my mama's mama had hers out, and my mama's 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 107 had hers out too years ago. Hi, you might as well give me dentures. My mama's got dentures. My mama's mama's got dentures. My mama's mama's... It's a path that people were taking in his family. And he said, you might as well do it, and the dentist did. And my father at age 18 became a dental cripple. Through the years, his teeth were relined, rebased, replaced, relined, rebased, replaced, relined, rebased, replaced, until they got so thick they clacked. Clackers, spinners, jumpers, and rockers, we create them every day. Clackers, spinners, jumpers, and rockers, that's my classification of edentulous patients. You know, they clack together because they've been relined and rebased so much, they get thick and heavy and plastic, and, and they rattle. You don't want two clackers in a family. That's what my mother was concerned about. Your daddy's a clacker. I don't want to be a clacker. Your daddy's a clacker. <laughs> she was a rocker. She had a partial denture that she wore that she took out to eat. She was a rocker. 38% of all the partials we make with all our care, skill, and judgment are not aren't even worn. So why do we make them? Because they're cheaper. Insurance will pay for it. So we leave patients where they are when we can put man on the moon. If we just take the time and when they say, oh, there's no way I can do this, figure that just means today, then you say, when will it be appropriate for you to have this done? How many of you have said something like that to, to patients and they tell you, when I get back? I mean, you know, I, I describe that after the cruise, after the wedding, after the graduation. You know, they'll tell you when, so find out when. And then say to them, well, let's go ahead and reserve an appointment then. Don't let the line go slack and let them walk out and you forget about them because I, I learned from experience it's easy to forget them. They're gone. And then you call them trying to figure out what to say to them. The so doctor goes on vacation and makes you do that. And it's like your heart's not in it. So totally ineffective. I'd rather you not call if your heart's not in it. So say, when will it be appropriate for you to have this done? And let them tell you when. If they say, oh, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do this. And say, what had you planned to spend on your dentistry? When they give you an amount, which in my experience is usually half, about half that, say, well, terrific, let's get started. You know, let's, let's talk to the doctor and find out what the priorities are. It might be that we start on the lower and do the upper later, you know, when it's appropriate for you. Let's go ahead and get patients started. Here's my point. Give patients alternatives in time versus alternatives in treatment. Because going down that little path of, you know, what mama did and mama's mama did and mama's mama, mama's, you know, all that takes the pa patient back to the past and not into the future that could be life-changing. You are a pivotal moment in this patient's life. Working in implant dentistry, I would see uh, dental cripples all the time. If I worked in the business office, they were there at the desk, many times with their hand clasped against their face. There are still dental cripples out there. There are 38 million people in the United States who don't have any teeth. There are 178 million people in the United States who are missing at least one tooth. These people are coming in, can you help me? And we're saying, well, if your insurance pays for it. We're doing that. I call prior authorizations prior denials. I tell patients that insurance pays for maintenance. Not much treatment, but once you get the treatment done, it will help you maintain it. But only a couple of times a year, you need to come in here about four times a year. You know, otherwise you're going to regress and start over, and you don't want to do that. You know, help patients, make good decisions, lead them, teach them, and they will do the right thing when the time is right. And then warn them. I met a doctor in Chicago. He said, I, I said to him, why should I come to you when I could go to this hunk of hunk of burning love over here? There was a cute young dentist. And I'm married, but I'm not dead. I should tell you about Erwin Schmottlack. He and his wife taught me everything. I mean, he's a, he was a patient at age 86, walked in. I'll tell you about him in a minute. But I asked this doctor, oh, why should I go to you instead of him? You know, why should I go? And he said, because I give guarantees. 
I said, how do you give guarantees to your patients? You don't know what your patients are going to do when they walk out of here. How do you give guarantees to say, I give them every day. I tell the patient, if you don't do this and do it soon, it's going to get worse. I guarantee. <laughs> he says, I tell the patient, if you don't do this and do it soon, not only will it get worse, it will be more expensive for you. It's never going to cost you less. I guarantee. The reality is that if the patient experiences loss, they pay and we might pay. And the problem is we just think they know all that. And so we don't help them move forward into care, whether their insurance pays for it or not. I was in Philadelphia. A lady was standing at the front desk so excited. I'm going to get my front teeth crowned. She was so excited. And she needed it. She was ugly. I don't have her picture, but you'd agree. She looked really bad. As far as her dentition was concerned, that's what I was focused on. It was really bad. And uh, she, she needed full coverage crowns. And, and it was the first week in December, and the receptionist says, well, you've reached your max, so you'll need to wait until next year to start this. And I'm freaking out because I'm not normal. And I'm thinking, that could be my mama standing there, and she said she has to wait. It's the first week in December. That could be my mama, and we're all coming home for Christmas, and we're all going to be in the kitchen, and she's going to spin around looking like that? I don't think so. So I walked up. I said, ma'am, excuse me. Is this something you really want to have done? It is, isn't it? She said, it is. That's why I'm here. I'm excited. I want to get it done. I said, could you care less what your insurance pays or doesn't pay? I mean, because after all, you, you've used all your insurance this year. What would you get done? A cleaning or two. I said, so they're not going to cover much anyway, and in fact, they might call this a pre-existing condition. I knew it was. I said, they might call this a pre-existing condition. They might exclude it. They might call it cosmetic. They might exclude that. And even if they do pay, they, don't, won't, they won't pay but about 50% of one tooth, and you got more than that that need treatment. Do you just want to get this done? She said, I want to get it done. I said, well, the total fee for your treatment is this. How would you like to just pay for it and get it done? She said, I've been saving. I can give you the money today. I can write you a check. I said, bless your heart, I'll write it out for you, and we can get it done. <laughs> I wrote the check out. She signed it. She tore it out, handed it to me. I turned to the receptionist who had kind of passed out almost sitting down. She was weak. I said, help me. I said, ma'am, I can't make you any promises, but if we could get this done for the holidays, would you like us to do our best to find some priority time for you so we can get this done for the holidays? I can't make you any promises, but would you like that? She said, oh, God, yes, my kids are coming home. That would be so wonderful. Pivotal moment. The next day, the receptionist said, I don't know how many times I've told patients, stop, because you reached your max. When I could have said, you can go. You can go. You get this done. You know, I don't want to stop you. The insurance wants to stop you, but I don't want to stop you. Let's go ahead. Patients will respond and do the things they want to do. But you know, folks, it took me a long time to figure that out because I was quoting fees in the thousands and thousands, and I had no idea anybody had that kind of money. But people have the money for the things they want to buy. They might not have it all today. They might be able to get it tomorrow. You know, working with people so they can receive life-changing care. Erwin Schmottlack walked in hanging on to his lower denture with his tongue. He was double diagnosed. He was a jumper and a spinner. If he let go of his lower denture, it would dump out. That's a dumper. <laughs> if I laugh or sneeze, <laughs> it's just going to jump right out there. My dad told a story about a preacher in the middle of his sermon. His denture jumped out and he grabbed it midair with his mouth. It's amazing. <laughs> so enthusiastic. That's passion. That's enthusiasm. <laughs> so Erwin was a jumper. Then he was a spinner. I had a patient tell me one time, I'm afraid if I let go of my lower denture, if it starts to move, it's going to do a full 360 in my mouth. From then on, anytime a patient says, oh, my goodness, I just can't hold this lower denture still. I don't have anything down there for it to hang on to. It just starts to move. I say, oh, I know what you're talking about. I've had patients tell me if they started to move, they were afraid it's going to spin all the way around in their mouth. Now, I make the gesture just this big. Because with people with nightmares about that happening, this is how big it is to them. It's not a little deal. It's a big deal. Jumpers, spinners, rockers, <sighs> clackers. Erwin Schmottlack stood there and said, Man, I can't hold this low tension. I'm afraid to move this spin. Can you help me? I said, yes, sir, we can. 
I had no idea what he needed, what kind of treatment would satisfy him. But I knew that his life would never be the same. Do you look at patients like that when they're just in the hygiene room? Is their life going to change as a, as a result of being with you for 45 minutes? Or is their teeth just, are their teeth just going to get cleaned? I mean, think about it. When you're the assistant, they heard the good news after getting a very thorough evaluation done, and you're sitting chair side, and the doctor walks out of the room. You know, you know the deal. The doctor says, what questions do you have about the treatment I've recommended? What does the patient always say? I don't have any. You explained it pretty good. And the moment the doctor leaves the room, the patient looks at you and says, what? Would you explain that to me in English? What in the world do you think I ought to do? I, I, I never knew I needed all that. I mean, you know, they kind of panic and go crazy. You know, when that kind of thing happens, what do you do? What do you say? How do you react? I can remember saying when a patient would say, ooh, I bet it's going to cost me, and the doctor wasn't in the room, I'd say, you have no idea. <laughs> that was a life-changing moment, wasn't it? You know, patients tell me it was worth more than what they paid for. In fact, I had a patient tell me that not doing it was too big of a price to pay. She'd have ended up like her mama and her mama's mama and her mama's mama's mama. I mean, it just, it, it, we can do so much now. Let us help you get this done. And patients would say, okay, let's do it. And then their life would never be the same. Like Erwin Schmottlack, he had implant dentistry done. I called on Thanksgiving Day. I wanted to see if he enjoyed turkey and dressing. Simple thing I wanted to know. Because if your heart's in it, you'll love these patients. You don't think about things like that. I called and Bernice's wife answered the phone. I said, Bernice, Bernice, did you make turkey and dressing? She said, yes. I said, is Erwin enjoying his turkey and dressing? She said, Joy, he is so happy he got those implants done. He's eating better than he's ever eaten ever. She, he just, yes. He's enjoying that turkey and dressing everything today. I said, that's great, Bernice. I just wanted to check on you folks. She said, but let me tell you the best thing about Erwin since he got those implants. I said, what is it? She said, well, now he's got more kissable lips. <laughs> Erwin was 86 years old. So was Bernice. When I'm 86, I want it to be said about me that I've got kissable lips. So I learned by asking questions. Tell me more, Bernice, tell me more. <laughs> she said, well, Joy, when he had that denture, he had to hang on with his tongue. He'd still be hanging on to it when he'd go to kiss me. <laughs> but now he just lays one on. <laughs> I said, Bernice, I'm making an office brochure featuring patients who have received this care so I can tell their story. I wanted somebody older than dirt <laughs> so I could say, you know, those patients who say, at my age, why, could I sit, why should I spend this kind of money? Have you heard that? I wanted to say, how old are you? 50. Oh, my Lord, have you met Erwin? I wanted to say, and he's 86, and, you know, here's what Bernice, I wanted to tell that story. I had pictures of patients who had received care so I could tell their story based on what their objection was. Like one woman said, what if I'm in an accident? I had a patient who had an accident and the implants actually held her together. So I had lots of illustrations I could use showing real people, real patients who had received care. One woman, her other dentist said she shouldn't do it and she did it anyway. And he said, you've thrown your money in the trash, it's gonna fall out tomorrow. And every time she'd come back for an annual implant evaluation, I'd say, has it fallen out? She'd say, no, and I put her picture on the brochure. So I could tell people, you know, that maybe your dentist doesn't, you know, doesn't know much about this or doesn't get involved, and we can help you. At any rate, uh, I, got, I wanted that picture of Erwin and Bernice. I said, I want a picture of the two of you kissing. Would that be all right, Bernice? She said, let me ask Erwin. Erwin came to the phone. I said, Erwin, I understand now that you had those implants done, you've got more kissable lips. Is that, is that so? He said, I guess so if she says so. I said, I want to get a picture of you kissing, you and Bernice kissing for our new office brochure. Would that be okay? He said, that'd be okay, Joy, as long as I can get a picture of me kissing you. <laughs> I said, let me speak to Bernice. <laughs> Bernice got on the phone. I said, Bernice, we don't need to get a picture of him kissing me. And she said... Oh, Joey, that'd be just fine. You get him excited and I'll take him home. <laughs> you 
Now, you know what? I could have ruined it for Bernice and Irwin if when they walked in that first time and he said, can you help me? I said, well, we need to do a very thorough evaluation. We need to determine if you're healthy enough and we need to find out if your insurance covers it and we need to find out this and that and the other thing. If I had done all that instead of just simply saying, yes, sir, we can, and then move him through the processing of moving forward instead of looking back, I could have ruined that whole thing. I met a little lady. I went to her 106th birthday in, in uh, Longview, Texas. 106th birthday. She got an implant at age 100. Also at age 100, she wrote a book. She was from Shreveport, Louisiana, a beautiful Cajun woman. She wrote a book full of pictures, full of stories, funny stories about growing up Cajun in, in Shreveport, Louisiana. They called me. They said, it's her 106th birthday. Joy, you want to come? I want to come because she worked in the dental office that I consulted with down there in Longview, Texas when she was 99 years old. She was their bookkeeper. She handled billings. She handled payables. She handled everything in, in finance and stuff at 99 years of age. I wanted to go. I fell in love with her while I was consulting with that practice. She made biscuits for me on her 106th birthday. I stayed in the home where she was with the, with the doctor and his wife. Happened to be the doctor's mother-in-law. Imagine employing your mother-in-law till she's 99. She got up at 106, made me homemade biscuits because I mentioned, I said, boy, last time I was here, you made some homemade biscuits. I've never had better. And she got up early and made me some homemade biscuits, then showed me how to work that buttermilk into the flour. Sweet little 106-year-old hand working it, working it. I love Mignon. At age 105, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. They said, you know, she needs surgery, but she's 105. And the family gathered around and said, she's lived this long. She's probably going to hang out longer. So they did a double mastectomy. Her great-grandson-in-law is a plastic surgeon, cosmetic surgeon. He reconstructed her <laughs> at age 105. And I was there for her 106th birthday, and there she was, beautiful. I've got her picture, and, and uh, we just had such a good time. Folks, what are you going to say? You're 105, or you're 100, 100, you know? What are you going to say when somebody comes in and says, I want to live? An 82-year-old man walked in the door and he said, can you fix this? And he pointed at a little lateral broken off even with the gum. I said, yes, sir, we can. I had no idea if there was even a root tip or how much of it was there or if anything was there or could be saved. I didn't know about any saucering a bone or any of that kind of stuff. He's just pointing at this hole between two teeth. It was a little lateral there. He said, can you fix this? I said, yes, sir, we can. He slapped his hand on the counter and said, good. He said, I just came from my other dentist. I play golf with him on Wednesday, go to church with him on Sunday. And when I showed him what had happened, asked him, can you fix this? He said, at your age, why bother? And I'm a bachelor, he said. <laughs> Was I going to ruin it? And say, well, we just have to see if you're healthy enough. We have to do an evaluation to determine what's there. We need to get, you know, the images and the doctor evaluation, all this kind of... It's, I was going to ruin it? Instead of just keep the glow in my eye and know that he wants his life to never be the same and I can help with that. See, patients have had an impact on me because I didn't think they could afford it. I didn't think they would do it. And one by one came in and did things and it changed me. They were the pivotal moment, the magic that happened to made me believe, that made me believe. Asking them, what do you think about the expense for having this, this done? Whoo, now that'll set you back. Well, how, what amount of money would you take for me to buy it back from you? Oh, no, 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 it's not for sale. My life has been changed, they would say. How has it been changed? And then they go down this fabulous list that's a part of their future and not their parents who did the easy thing that we told them to do. A young dental assistant came to me. She said, my mother lost number eight. It broke, and, and uh, she went to the local dentist just 20 miles away and, and got the tooth removed. I called her. I said, Mama, 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 you ought to get an implant in there. She said, oh, it's fine, honey. They gave me a little flipper. And this dental assistant said, I watched my mom's self-esteem go down, 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 down over the next 19 years until she died in deep depression. 
Is it possible that something as simple as wearing a flipper and worrying about is it moving, is it going to fall, is it going to, you know, is, is it possible that that affected everything else in her life? I know it is. So give patients an alternative in time. Believe that they want to receive the best of care. Move them forward. Use great language like, when will it be appropriate for you to have this done? What have you planned on spending for your dentistry? Let's go ahead, let me help you with figuring out how you can get this done. Not maybe, possibly, hopefully, if your insurance pays for it. Because insurance doesn't want to pay. I tell patients, let me just tell you what they're going to pay. <laughs> Nothing, <laughs> if they can get by with it. It's not that they're bad people, they just have <laughs> good business savvy to know they would rather keep your money than to pay it out. You know, they do. So I'm just telling you the truth, let me be the first to tell you they don't want to pay for this. This is something you really need to have done. Let's figure out a way. You know, it, working in the field that I work in now, uh, the field of implant dentistry, what's fascinating to me is that when I consult with other offices that are doing general restorative care, for example, it's amazing how much we think pa people will not do a crown. When that is like that much of a treatment plan, many cases in full mouth reconstruction, it's like that much. And we don't think they can afford a crown, yet people walk in in the smallest of towns with priorities about their life and their health, and they will receive care if we believe they will before we introduce doubt. I tell docs, when you walk out of a case presentation, don't say to the patient, well, if you maybe possibly decide, hopefully sometime in the future, if your insurance covers this, to do this, let us know, give us a call. Don't say that. Many times the doctor doesn't say all that, but they'll say, well, if you decide to do this, give us a call or we'll look forward to seeing you. If you decide, they put that little doubt, that little, it's not that important kind of priority. And I say, I say docs, don't say that. Just say, we look forward to seeing you next time. We'll take great care of you and walk out. Don't suck a beautiful future out from under them, you know, and force them to live in the past like their mama and their mama's mama and their mama's mama's mama. Folks, we can put man on the moon. Jared, did I answer that question for you? <laughs> Over answered a little bit. Does that make sense? You are required to inform patients about alternatives. The way you do that is when they accept treatment, you then move in to inform consent. When they say, yes, yes, this is what I want to do, and it's your treatment recommendation, then you say, I am required, you basically pivot and move into informed consent. I am required to inform you about the alternatives of care. One alternative, for example, is to do nothing. <laughs> I don't recommend it, and here's why. So then take them through the, I'm concerned, here's why, I recommend, let's go ahead. Here's why I recommended this, you know, and go through the process of making sure they understand why you recommended one thing over the, over the other. Uh, and, and why, you know, what some of the other alternatives might be, maybe your mom or somebody had something like that done, I don't know, uh, but we can do better than that now. You know, and talk to them about what we can do and what they can have done, and then decide when and what. When, when it will be appropriate and what had they planned on spending for their dentistry, work with them, and of course warn them about any risk of loss if they don't proceed, especially with recommended necessary care. Does that make sense? All right, let's move forward then. Let's go to this next little point of influence on your handout. If you want to fill in that little spot, it's managing risk. Managing risk. I personally like Warren Buffett's definition of risk. It's very simple, it's to the point. It's risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. <laughs> very simple. It comes from not knowing what you're doing. And let me tell you what will happen in your practice if you don't manage risk. If you don't know anything about managing risk, if you haven't paid attention to what's going on or what's being said. For example, simple things like I walked, I was standing in a, in a, a dental office and the receptionist was talking to a patient at the front counter about their dentures. And the reception room was full. Well, most of you in the room would know that's a HIPAA violation. You gotta, people have a right to privacy. 
but they had always talked to patients at the desk because that's the point of scheduling. They would schedule the patient. Then if the patient had any questions about what was going to be done in the process, they would discuss treatment at the front desk. They had to go through a little transition about maybe this is not the spot to do this, but this would be better, <laughs> you know, where there's a little bit of privacy. I am now teaching practices to schedule the patient's appointments while they're still in the clinic for a couple of good reasons. One reason is right to privacy. You can discuss their treatment with them while they're still in the clinic in a private setting. You can do that. The other reason is I have determined, based on evaluating practices and the loss of their patients and how does that happen, I have determined that that long, slow walk from the clinic to the front desk in that lapse of time comes a loss of interest and patients get out of the practice without scheduling. They'll walk by the front desk and the, uh, the receptionist or someone in the business office is on the phone. And they'll just wave and say, I'll call you. And they leave and time goes by and they don't get scheduled. In the clinic also, if they're sitting back there and they object to anything, you have a better setting in order to talk about, I'm concerned, here's why, I recommend, let's go ahead. You have a better setting to, to discuss things with them. So look at your schedule and find out, when can I do that? When can I go ahead and reserve their next appointment? When can I you know, do that while they're in the clinic? Even hygienists, I, I recommend, the further away they get from your hygiene room to the point of scheduling, the less likely they are going to remain in your recall system. Because going up front, when I observe up front many times, I hear habit conversations. Do you want me to go ahead and schedule that next appointment? Oh, I'll just send you a postcard. And I hear that all the time because the people don't necessarily know why it's important for this patient to come back. Maybe they don't have the hygienist insight into the periodontal condition or you know what's going on or what's at risk in this patient's mouth. It's just focus on an appointment at the front desk does not focus on the need, the necessary care and the critical nature of that, you know, that the hygienist might be privy to. So the further away from the hygiene room, the less likely the patient is going to schedule. And it's not because the business team are slack, it's because sometimes they're busy or they're focused on just you know, getting them out and paying their bill or making sure their insurance is handled. They're focused on other things. And that next appointment's not a priority, especially if we can just text them, do the simple thing, and uh, the computer automatically does that and you'll get a notice, just give us a call when you get the notice. You know, we put the patient at risk. So I personally prefer uh, scheduling when the patient is back there. It reduces risk, reduces risk in relationship with the patient and is more likely to uh, get the patient on the books and scheduled on the, you know, on the computer and schedule. It's, you're more likely to do that if we do it in the clinic. Find a time to make that happen. Uh, patients, patients who get mad get even. Now I've already told you this, they, if they get mad, they get even. What makes them mad? What happens in your practice, practice that could possibly make them mad? Does waiting make them mad? Sure it does. My husband went to his doctor because they worked him in for an appointment at three o'clock. His blood pressure had spiked, he's high risk, he just had a massive stroke in July this year, and uh, he, uh, you know, it, it was pretty doggone scary. And so we went, when, when he went to his doctor's office, when his blood pressure was elevated, it was very critical, it was important because he was a, at risk of a stroke. So I called, I said, he needs to get in. And, and he's, his blood pressure, we can't seem to control it. He's taking this medication, but something's happened. It's just spiking, it's crazy. And, uh, and it, it's, I'm concerned. They got him a three o'clock appointment. My sweet husband said, I'll drive myself. You, you're going out of town. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm fine. This has happened before. I'm fine. So he gets in the car and he drives over to the doctor's office and he can't find a parking space because we've sent this particular internal medicine physician thousands of patients, it seems, because he's such a cool guy and uh, really actually is the one who found high blood pressure in my, in my husband. So uh, we sent him over there, he, he, he went, he couldn't find a parking space, he drives around, drives around, finally gets a parking space about a block away, walks into the office 10 minutes after his three o'clock appointment, and the greeting from the receptionist was, you're late, we can't see you. But according to him, I said, how did she exactly do that? How did she, what was the circumstance? Was she sitting down? 
Uh, was anybody else standing there? Were there other people in the reception room? He said, Joy, it was the same as always. They're packed. I walked in. I stood at the counter. She was on the phone. She got off the phone. She looked up. Apparently, there's a clock above the counter. She looked up, saw the time, looked at me and said, you're late. We can't see you. I have to reschedule you. What do you think happened to my, blood my husband's blood pressure at that very moment? He became a risk management situation. After everything settled down, he lost it, including screaming at them that he sat in the reception room 45 minutes the last time he was in there. And it's like, I came on time but couldn't find any parking. And, you know, he's screaming, if you guys will get these people out of here, maybe they could clear up. I mean, he was just losing it, losing it. I'm glad I wasn't there for that. But I heard about it, and I got to consult with this doctor's office, and here's what I found out. They had been to a seminar where they were taught, if a patient walks in late, don't see them, teach them. If you see them, they think they can just run all over you. Stupid speaker consultant. They just put this doctor at risk, my husband at risk, everything at risk. What can you do? You know, when patients walk in late, what do you do? You know what I do? You're here! She's here! Oh, we were so worried about you. No, she, she looks fine. Are you fine? You're okay? Oh, she's okay. Oh, we were so worried about you. Here, you're having surgery so you can't have any water, but <laughs> are you okay? What's going on? Oh, yeah, she's fine. She's here. You know, then we can say, let me see what we can still do. Instead of, I'll have to check to see if we can still see you. <laughs> For you hygienists, you're standing up there saying, if she's not here in the next five minutes, then I'm not going to see her. It's not fair. I don't have time. And then I run into the next patient's time, and, and I'm not going to see him. And then they walk in, and the reception is all upset because she's got to deal with you, and got to deal with them, got to deal with you. And the doctor's talking about production, and now you got to deal with them. And, <laughs> And then the doctor says, what happened to that patient? I thought she was here. Wasn't she here? Did she not see? And then there's conflict between the doctor and the hygienist. And <sighs> risk, risk, risk. 100% of the cases that I've been involved with where there was a subpoena that arrived to an office or a consulting client had a situation and uh, I investigated, let me tell you, we can put a practice at risk or we can keep a practice from risk if we manage it. There was an office manager in Houston said a patient came in and said, I'm not happy with the, with the results of my treatment. Office manager said, you had a very complex situation. It was a very, very tough case. So what, what are you asking? She said, I, I think I should get a little ref refund. I don't think I got my money's worth. The office manager told me the story herself, said I put my hands on my hips and said, we should have charged you more. Your case was very difficult. There's no way we're giving you a refund. And the doctor wishes he had been involved in that conversation because the settlement <laughs> that occurred in court after loss of time, loss of energy, sleepless nights, how do we testify, who do we, who do we get, I mean, who's going to prove the value of this case, how do we, you know, it was, it was a mess and the settlement was way, 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 way much more than what the patient was asking for. When patients get mad, they get even. They get even. So you don't want to make patients mad. Manage risk. Do what you can to create a system for managing risk. I was in an office last year. They had a medical emergency. They had no protocol for managing medical emergencies. So I had to put my hat back on <laughs> and work in there as you know, part of the team to make sure this patient was going to live. And uh, you know, fortunately, even on that flight this past week, they tried to keep this lady alive. People released their seat belts, even though the plane was going down in a, in a hurry to help save this woman's life. It didn't work out for her, but they, they were willing to do what they could do. Folks, do you have protocol for managing risk? When risk happens in your practice, stuff happens. People do things. People don't act right. You need to have a protocol for how to manage it. I had a man walk by my, my office. I was the office manager in a big practice, and a man walked by the office, stuck his head in the door and said, can I drink a fifth of liquor every day? I said, sir, I can't answer that question, but let me find someone who can. <laughs> At the time, I didn't know for sure whether that would complicate matters with his surgery. I went back, found the doctor. I said, uh, doctor, come, come to find out it was moonshine he was wanting to have. He made it himself. 
And uh, I asked the doctor, I said, he wants to have a fifth every day. Is that okay? And the doctor said, if he brings me one, it'd be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have protocol for that? What's the protocol for antibiotics or any of that before a patient goes back? Manage risk, know what you need to do, know, you know what the protocol is. Uh, take time to figure that out in your office. It's a point of influence. It can put you and your patient at risk or not. Manage risk. Next thing, next little point of influence for you is the best use of time. What is the best use of your time? I seriously want you to think about this because I'm talking, you know, let me get back to the fact that this program is for you. I'm talking about you, whoever you are, whatever you do in the, in the practice, this is for you. What is the best use of your time? I had a big pivotal moment when I decided it was time for me to move. I was physically moving and going to leave a practice that I worked with and moving 70 miles away for various reasons. One important reason was to take care of my parents. And one of the things that happened when I was getting ready to move was I totally realized that I had a big challenge with not being aware of the best use of my time. Because when I started creating the training mechanism to get people plugged into taking over my responsibilities, I realized I was not using my time effectively. I had talent working with me in the office waiting to be discovered that I had never even reached out for. There were so many people in the office working with me who could do things and I had not learned, even though the first doctor that I worked with said you can and today you will, I had become possessive of power. I hope you don't do that because it will hold you back and it will hold everyone else back around you who might have talent waiting to be discovered. See, the challenge is we get busy. And I love Thoreau's quote when he said, it's not enough to be busy, so are the ants. The question is, what are we busy about? We get busy and we don't realize, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> maybe there's someone else in here who would be better at this. I worked in an office one time and they needed help. And, and uh, I, I, I said, well, let's find some help. About that time, a little girl walked into the office. Her name was Erica. She said, hi, I'd love to work here during the summer. I'm studying communication in college, but I've got the summer off. I'm paying my own way, and I'd love to get a job here. I've got a girlfriend that works here, and she said you might be hiring some summer help. Well, we had some projects that needed to be done. I said, Erica, we'd love to, we'd love to talk to you about working for the summer. I hired her. Before I knew it, she was just running up to me saying, I'm all done. We'd given her little projects to do, and she'd run up and say, I'm all done. I love that new employee enthusiasm, volunteering for everything. While everybody else is hiding, she was volunteering. <laughs> you know, they would say, don't volunteer for another thing. You're making us look bad. Would you stop it? You know, <laughs> at any rate, I just loved her enthusiasm. And she, I'm done. What else can I do? I'll never forget saying, you know, seek patients. They, and so the assistants don't have to come all the way out here. The hygienists don't have to come all the way out here. You, you know, they could let you know when they're ready and you can bring the patient back to them. And, and uh, that would be very helpful. She put a whole new twist on that. If a patient would walk in the door, she wouldn't even let their behind hit the chair. She was at them, you know, embracing them before they even sat down. And she was saying to them, oh, you must be, and I'm Erica. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Wait, you're a new patient in this office. You're going to love it here. I've been here seven weeks today. And she would throw her arm around them and walk them down the hall. Totally bizarre. Had a woman walk in with a child, bleeding lip, teeth, you know, blood coming down and and the child was clinging to mom. He'd bust his lip, broken his tooth. And we were trying to find a chair to put the child in. He was a little emergency. And, and uh, I noticed that while we were looking for a chair and the mother was filling out some paperwork with him clinging to her body, uh, <laughs> bleeding, <laughs> the uh, mother was speaking sign language to him. And I didn't know sign language. I think I, I knew a couple of signs I can't use here today. But uh, <laughs> she was, you know, you know, just talking to him. 
And uh, I remember that Erica had told me that she studied communication. And, and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to, to see if she knows sign language? Because I don't know sign language. So I went and found Erica. I said, Erica, do you know any sign language? She said, oh, yeah, I'm studying communication, but my mother teaches sign language. So I've known sign language my whole life. I said, come, help, help, help. <laughs> Next thing I know, little Erica was cross-legged on the floor talking about ninja turtles with this little boy. The mother saw this, gasped when she saw it, and uh, then said to us, uh, he's never talked to anyone else but me. Pivotal moment, magical influence, incredible experience for this kid in trauma in our office for the first time. That stuff uh, is amazing to me. What is the best use of your time? I want you to evaluate what you do and what value you bring. And it doesn't need to be just clinical value that you bring to the practice. There are some things that I think you can specialize in. For example, dealing with difficult patients. Are you an expert with that? Because <laughs> they come in sometimes. Are you really good at talking their language when they're mean and nasty? I mean, how do you deal with people when they walk in? I want you to seriously think about what you bring to the office. I tell doctors all the time, hire someone for the entertainment value alone. Because if you would lighten up just a little bit, <laughs> many of your problems could be solved. But then I'll have a hygienist tell me, oh, we can't have fun in our office. And I'll ask why not. Oh, if I even say to the patient while I'm doing the hygiene, if I even say to the patient, are you having fun yet? She said, the doctor grabs me by the collar, pulls me out into the hall and says, we're not here to have fun. We're professionals. <laughs> I asked her, how long have you worked for this doctor? She said, 13 years. And I had to ask, why? <laughs> you know, what are you a specialist doing? Do you lighten people up? I had a dental assistant by the name of, uh, little, 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 wait a minute, which one am I wanted to tell you about now? Oh, my goodness, so many. Jane. Jane. I never saw Jane. Didn't need to see Jane. She certainly managed herself. She uh, really kind of ran the clinic. And uh, I was in the business office at this time in that office. And I and, uh, never saw Jane, but I'd see notes from Jane at the end of the day. There would be a post-it note on my lamp on my desk. I know you've had a tough day. Have a terrific evening. Love, Jane. You think that made any difference to me after a tough day? I told doctors, I said, meet the, meet the team as, as they exit the building, kind of like flight attendants. Ba-ba, 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 ba-ba. You know, but don't do that. Don't just say, oh, hey, see you guys, thanks guys, thanks guys, thanks guys, great job, great job, Hi. thanks, thanks, thanks. You know, d don't do that. I want you to be specific. Something they did today that really mattered, that really made a difference, that was one of those pivotal things that you so appreciate. I want you to point something out to them that they did. And so the, the team, about 25 in that office, would, would be exiting at the end of the day. I had two doctors standing flanking the exit door. And, and as the team members would go by, they, they'd say, hey, thanks for the way you worked with that witch today. Man, you were awesome with her. She was mean and nasty. I wanted to punch her, but you just took care of her, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much, you know. You're an expert at that. As I watched team members leave, it looked like so much fun. I jumped in line. By the time I got there, they said, you got that report for us? <laughs> Everyone needs recognition, folks, including doctors. I have awards events for offices every year to recognize the magical, amazing things that we don't see. It might be invisible skills because superheroes, you don't necessarily see them. You don't know when they're showing up, but something happens, and it's like magical. And, and uh, they, they aren't born superheroes. They just you know, are willing to do things other people are not willing to do. And we don't always catch them because they're superheroes. You know, they don't want to be caught. They don't want recognition. They don't want you to make a big deal about what they're doing. You know? but, but they do amazing things. Libby, another one, superhero, superhero. She would say to me as we pass in the hall, get a grip, Joy. That's pivotal, in my opinion. Because at the moment in my life when she would say that, I needed to get a grip. And some people don't care enough about you to say, you know, hey, come on, let's go, let's go over here for a moment. Even my colleagues will tell you, leave it at the door. Don't bring your stuff into the office. Of course, some of those same colleagues who have taught that for years are going through hell. And they're glad somebody picks up the phone and calls. You know, your turn will come. 
I want to work with a team that's inextricably woven in the fabric of each other's success, that have special skills and know how to use their time because it takes nanoseconds to make amazing differences in people's lives. A doctor called me from Philadelphia. He said, the women are about to kill each other. I said, same women? He said, and then some. He said, Joy, we've grown. I had consulted with his practice 15 years prior. He said, we've grown, you know, we've doubled in size. I mean, he said, so same women and then some. I said, what's going on? I knew their ages. You know, that's why I asked same women, because I knew their ages. I said, could it be hormones? He said, they're all on drugs. <laughs> I said, what's going on? He said, there is just so much conflict. It's almost to the level of hatred. He said, you know, I've got, even my office manager, he said, I don't know what it is. He said, but I need help. I cannot handle this. So I took off to Philadelphia. When I got there, yeah, it was pretty tense. The first thing someone said to me was critical of the new assistant. Doctor, all he talks about is how great she is. And we've been here for 15 years, and he doesn't say anything to us, just like nothing, nothing ever. But every time, you know, we turn around, he's talking about how great she is, you know, and and there were some other explicatives in describing her, and they were just mean and nasty. The office manager, I just thought, maybe she's just aging out. Maybe it is time for her to leave. I don't know, because her spirit was like flat. It was dead. So I did a little exercise with the team. I said, you guys have grown. You've got twice the team you have, you know, and I think it's time for us to sit down and kind of get to know each other again. I did a little exercise where I give people five minutes to talk about themselves and where they grew up and about their family and about their pets and all the, you know, just so we could just hear who they are. And I tell the rest of the team, don't interrupt. If they've got a dog, don't say you've got a dog too. You know, don't interrupt. Let them tell their story. You know, if they say they adopted, don't say, well, I adopted too. You know, just let them, it's their time. You, let's use that time for them. And uh, so we went around the room and everybody kind of told their story. And if they stop talking, you know, and their five minutes is not up, I want you to, to uh, ask questions about them. Don't interrupt them. Talk, you know, but ask questions. Well, tell me about that and tell me more about that. And what, what did you do then? Or whatever they tell you, let's, let's get to know them. Take five minutes. Well, the truth of the story is I only give them four minutes, but I tell them I'm giving them five not because I lack integrity, but because I want to show people how much you can get to know about a person if you focus on them. If you just ask questions about them instead of interrupting, which is a human habit, I have it. I like to interrupt and tell you about I, 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 this. And so I have, to, I have to work on that consciously. I have that habit. So we went around the room. They got to know each other like the new girl. <laughs> She had just moved from California to Pennsylvania and, and uh, cross country, brought her kids. And, you know, we kind of heard a little bit about that. And she's temporarily living with her parents. And, and that was, you know, her story. Then we did another little exercise. And I asked him, I said, you can pass on this exercise. Absolutely, there is, you do not have to do this exercise. But if you're willing and would like to share with the group, with the team, what is the, what is the biggest challenge you're facing that you're willing to share? I'm going to give you two minutes, and yes, I'm honest, I'll give you two minutes, two minutes, if you're willing to share. Well, nobody passed, everybody participated. One of the first ones to participate was the office manager. Maybe she did because she felt like she should because she was office manager. And she said, and by the way, the doctor said she, she was the biggest witch. She had totally changed, mean and nasty. He didn't know if he could continue to employ her because she was not only mean to, to him, mean to the staff, mean to, I mean, kind of snapping at patients. He said, it's, it's critical now. She went first, and the most critical challenge, you know, most difficult challenge she was facing that she was willing to share. She said, uh, you guys noticed I ran out of the office this week. She said, I got a phone call. It was an anonymous call. Somebody said I should go over to my son's house. She said, my son was out of work, and I knew that. And I thought, oh, my God, what's going on? I have a two-year-old granddaughter that lives there and my daughter-in-law. She said, so I told you guys I've got to run an errand, and I took off. She said, I went over to my son's house, which had become a crack house. She said, I, my daughter-in-law was stoned. She said, my two-year-old granddaughter was naked on the big king bed. She said, I swooped that two-year-old and, and took her away for her safety. You remember the day I didn't come back? It's because I was taking care of the baby. She said, uh, uh, that's the biggest challenge I'm facing right now. And ding, two minutes was up. Everyone sat there stunned. No wonder she's a bitch. I 
I don't know what you'd feel if that was happening to you, or your grandchild, or I, I don't know what, you'd, what, what kind of person you would become. But she was, she was having challenges, but just didn't know what was going on. And all of a sudden found out that this was going on when her son would leave town. It was devastating. When she said that, all of, all of the, the air in the room changed. And everyone, instead of looking at her like she was a mean and nasty woman, instead looked at her like she's a mama bear, you know, there to defend and protect. She just happens to be working, and it's kind of interfering right now with where her heart is. But understanding that makes a big difference. We went around the room. It was a very interesting time to hear sharing that day. No one seemed to pass. And we got to the new girl, you know, the one that was so special. She said, well, I, I haven't told you guys, but the reason I came here from California was because we escaped a very violently abusive husband. She said, my husband would beat me, but when he started beating the kids, I had to get away. She said, I took them and we escaped and, you know, when he was at work, we left. We, he, he, kn he knows where we are. It's a little bit frightening. She said, but I need this job. I'm taking care of my kids. And she said, the biggest thing, I guess, that I challenge I'm facing right now is that um, I just found out my teenage daughter's an alcoholic. And ding, two minutes were up. And once again, the atmosphere in the room changed. The opinion of this girl who needs this job because she has to take care of herself and her kids and escaped a violent situation, their opinion of her changed. No wonder she's doing such a great job that the doctor notices it. She needs this job. And they completely changed their attitude about her. Folks, what is the best use of your time? Are you so focused on picking up the scaler and cleaning teeth, you know? or picking up the instrument you're going to pass to the doctor, or answering the phone to stop it from ringing, that you don't realize how amazing it is what you do, so that every moment of the day matters, every in interaction really counts. What is the best use of your time? I look for specialists in dental offices all the time because I know you're there. There is talent waiting to be discovered. You have special gifts, special ag abilities, plus you can suck spit and blow air and do all that other stuff. I want to find you. I want to see what it is that really is life-changing for your patients because, after all, we're talking about points of influence. Now, as far as time is concerned, this is a lesson I learned from one of my mentors. Reserve time for the things you want to do. If you want to have a better team, <laughs> play. Find a time you can, you can have a better team. You know, X out time in the schedule so you can get together, get to know each other, and play and enjoy knowing who you work with to become a team. You know, you rehearse often. I tell doctors, schedule an hour each week to become experts at how to, uh, how to provide the clinical care that you wish to provide. Because if we, if we study, if we rehearse, if we get, you know, if we understand why you do it this way and that way and do this first and that next, if we understand that patients are more likely to move forward and have a very speedy recovery through the process of our treatment. Spend an hour each week, I suggest, getting, uh, getting better, in fact, becoming experts at communicating with patients. Read great books on leadership. Read great books on communication. You know, how to care for people, how to provide better service. What an Im impact eye contact makes. Posture for treatment acceptance. If you posture for treatment acceptance and make eye contact with a patient, when you're talking to them about treatment, treatment acceptance will go up. You'll learn that in the first three minutes, 75% of the buying decisions are made. What do you say in the first three minutes? Let's have a whole meeting on talking about the first three minutes. Doctor, allow your team to listen to your case presentation to tell you what you say and what, what is the point of no influence when patients start backing up and dropping their chin. What is it that you said that may have frightened them or did you say too much? How long is a perfect case presentation? Spend time studying these things and you will get better. It, it just takes a, a look, a gesture, a sigh to discourage patients from receiving care. Watch for those things and work together as a team to figure out what's going on there. Reserve time for the things you want to do. How many of you have prioritized your time as far as treatment acceptance is concerned and what patients should do? Do you block schedule? Do you know that there's a better time in your office to see new patients than other times in your office? You know, when should that be? 
When should you do what? When should you schedule, you know, all these things that you provide? Reserve time for the things you want to do and you'll get to do them. A doctor uh, who was a mentor to a practice that I had the privilege of working with said, Joy, do you know how to schedule treatment? I said, sure. I, I've worked in dentistry for a long time and I let him know how special I was. <laughs> He said, let me show you how to schedule. He grabbed a napkin. It just happened to be on the table. It was after hours. We were at dinner. He grabbed a napkin. He drew an X. I said, oh, I know how to schedule Xs. You write in the top quadrant, you know, assistant time, then doctor time, assistant time, doctor time, and go around until the treatment is, is complete. Yeah, I know, how to, I know how to do it. He said, oh, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I want you to X out Tuesday. <laughs> and reserve it for this treatment your doctor wants to do. I said, but, but, but we're booked up 18, 16, 18 weeks in advance, and, and we don't have an appointment you know, for 16 or 18 weeks for that type of treatment. You know, when can I fill it if I don't fill it with what the doctor wants to do? He said, uh, well, if you exit out Tuesday morning, wait until Monday afternoon at about 4 o'clock before you fill it. I said, but, but doc, I'll be there all night trying to fill that schedule. He said, joy. He said, what if you fill that schedule and the patient walks in at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon and says, oh, yes, how soon can we start? And you don't have an appointment for 16 or 18 weeks. What could happen to that patient? With a lapse of time comes a loss of interest. That's why insurance companies, by the way, ask for prior authorizations. With a lapse of time comes a loss of interest. He said, Joy, the patient could move, the patient could die, the patient could find someone else who could treat them in a more timely manner. When somebody decides they want to do something, they want to do it right now. He said, Joy, reserve time for the things you want to do and you will do them. I said, oh, do I have to? But I did. I went back, I exed off Tuesday. Next thing I knew, it was filled with what the doctor wanted to do. Then I exed off Wednesday and it was filled with what the doctor wanted to do. And then Thursday, same thing, it was filled. Reserve time for the things you want to do, whether it's at the office or at home, because if you don't reserve time, you know what I'm going to say. They're going to be gone. They're going to be gone, and you're going to wonder what happened. Time flies by while we're busy. Reserve time for the things you want to do, and, of course, identify what is the best use of your time. What is the best use of your time? That's going to take some soul searching and some real searching to figure out, am I doing something in the office someone else could do? Am I holding them back as well as holding me back because I think I'm so special? They might just be able to do it better than I can, and that would free me up so the doctor will trust them, and then I can go do this, which is where I would be best used. That's what I should be doing. Back to your cycle here. Here's another one. Uh, what is the point of influence there? Next one on this whole group of lists is the reward. Now, I hope there is a reward for what we do. I hope there is. How is your reward received in your practice, in your life? Well, I have a theory as far as financial rewards. The quality of care you wish to provide determines your fees. Collection of those fees determines whether or not you can afford to provide quality care at the level you desire. Now, I have known a dentist who won the lottery down in Miami, Florida. He didn't just win it once, he won it twice. Got that thing figured out somehow. I don't know how, but he won. Maybe he is not quite as sensitive or concerned about collections of, the collection of the fees. But the fact of the matter, it's a sign. If patients pay us, it's a sign that they see the value of what we did. If patients give you a tip, it's a sign that they see the value that far outweighs the price, in fact, beyond what you charge them. Tips come in the form of the food they bring you and showing up early and squealing about how glad they are to see you or writing letters telling you how they changed your life. I mean, how you changed their life, excuse me. Those are tips. TIP stands for to ensure performance. Tips uh, given early are often uh, a sign of their expectation. I hope I get this great care next time I come in. When patients pay the way we ask them to pay, I always thank them. And then I always say, you know, you make it easy for us to provide the best quality care that money can buy. You make it easy for us. You make it easy for us to roll out the red carpet for you every time you come in. If I'm going to say that to a patient because <laughs> that's kind of a tip for their future performance in the event they or their family members need care, it would be nice for them to say, take your money and pay them in advance. They'll take special care of you. <laughs> 
You know, it's kind of a tip for me to say thank you. By, by taking care of the full fee associated with treatment, you make it easy for us to roll out the red carpet for you every time you come in. Thank you. By paying the full fee associated with your treatment, you make it easy for us to provide the best dentistry money can buy. When I say that to a patient, then I want to go show the doctor the money. This is crazy, but I notice that this works. I mean, there, let me back up and tell you one thing, another thing that works. I found out if I tell dental assistants just before the doctor meets a new patient, hygienist, you can use this too because sometimes you see the new patients first. Just before the doctor meets a new patient, simply say to the doctor, hey, doc, this patient's loaded. <laughs> and just pay attention. Notice whether or not they get a little pep in their step. Woo, am I glad to meet you. We'd love to have you and your whole family come in. I mean, see if they don't get just a little pep in their step. Well, I noticed that after a patient pays, if you get the full fee, especially in advance, have any of you ever had that happen where patients pay in advance? That's pretty, pretty fun. Oh, no? Have any of you had it happen where patients pay in full in advance over here? Was that kind of a happy day in the dental office, kind of fun? You didn't say, oh, no, you don't have to. Here, no, you don't have to. You didn't say that, did you? You took it joyfully and said, thank you, thank you. By taking care of this, you make it easy for us to roll out the red carpet for you. Well, if you're going to say something like that to a patient, I immediately take the money, show it to a doctor. And if it's cash, I drop some just to see them scramble. <laughs> you know, that's kind of fun. And then, and then after we pick it all up and I'll say, don't look at the money if it's a check or, you know, I've got a credit card, you know, receipt or something. I'll, I'll say, look at the name. I just told this patient, you're going to give her the best dentistry money can buy. Don't you let me down. Could they blow it? Could they ruin it? So I said that to say this. If we provide a positive point of influence for our patients, let's make sure we discuss it as a team so nobody ruins it in your office. I went into an office and the doctor said, Joey, Joey, in the last month, my staff collected 40,000 more in one month than has ever been collected in any single month in the history of this practice. Now, I had consulted with him two months prior. They weren't asking patients to pay. They were fantasizing about payment because the doctor that had retired did that, sold the practice to this young doctor who said, I, don't, I can't operate that way. I, I, we got to figure out some financial arrangements. So I taught them how to ask for money, how to get paid. One of the gals said, I believe I can do it. And she showed up, boy, I'm telling you, and collected 40,000 more in one single month than ever in the history of the practice in a single month. I asked the doctor, did you tell them? Did you tell them that's what they did? He said, do you think I should? I said, doc, you got to do it. It's a reward to recognize them for the good behavior. If you want more good behavior, you know, don't take it for granted. Recognize them. You know, this is good. I'm proud of them. I'm telling you, because they've never done this before themselves. He said, how should I do it exactly? I said, well, let's go into the staff room for the morning huddle. I picture you climbing on the table there in the center of the room. When they get, when you get their attention, wave your arms like a crazy person. Everybody's going to look at you. And as soon as they look at you, I want you to tell them, hey, I've got good news. You know, you guys collected 40,000 more last month than you ever have in a single month in the history of this practice. I said, when you do that, I'm going to start high-fiving. We'll start applauding. Woo-hoo, way to go. You know, we're going to run around. I'll, I'll, I'll make some commotion. He said, are you for real? You think we should do that? I said, absolutely. If, if you don't climb on that table and wave your arms like a crazy man, I'm just going to know you're weak, worthless loser. I didn't know he'd really do it, <laughs> but I thought I'd put a little pressure on. Next thing I know, we're back there for the huddle. He climbs up on the, cha on the chair and on the table and waves his arm like a crazy man. Everybody's looking at him like he's nuts. He's lost it. And then he tells them, I'm so proud of you guys. Last month, you collected 40000 more than you've ever collected in a single month. I'm so proud of you. I started hooping and hollering, woohoo, five five, and you know, we had a big hilarious thing, and the and the sound started coming down, you know, the noise and the hilarity started coming down, and then he spoke again. He said, But we've got a long way to go. I wanted to be a table tipper. I wanted to knock him <laughs> off that table. I was so mad at this loser. It's like, are you kidding me? Here's my point. I don't know if any of you ever drove a stick drive. Anybody ever drive a stick drive? Anybody drive one now? 
You know, one of the scariest things, when you get it in gear and it pops out of gear, he popped it out of gear. If you get them in gear, don't pop them out of gear. You know, if you get them moving forward, keep them moving forward. You can bite your tongue if you just think they can do better. Realize that, you know, they've done so much at this point. And that goes for everybody in the office who's training someone involved in training. You can do it. Quality of care you wish to provide determines your fees. Collection of those fees determines whether or not you can afford to provide quality care at the level you desire. So get real good at receiving the war, uh, reward and being grateful. I've already said this, so I won't spend much time on this, but you know, sell your dentistry not based on price. Instead, sell your dentistry based on value. If, if value is there, patients will pay. Patients will reward you for the value they receive. And it sometimes has nothing to do with the clinical aspects of care. It's that their life is not the same. In implant dentistry, I always talk about how their life changed. They go out to eat now. They didn't go out before. You know, they smile now. They didn't before. They, they sing. They do think they just, everything, including <laughs> they have kissable lips now. They didn't have that before. Everything matters to people, so focus on that. And the last fill in the blank on your handout, this point of influence is what I think is absolutely one of the most important ones is the quality of your life. The quality of your life. You know, I've learned a lot from dogs. Learned a lot about leadership from dogs. I might share, share that with you in just a second. But I've learned a lot from dogs, including this one. That's Ducky. He's also got a little Ducky, but that's Ducky. He's a Chinese crested. My daughter adopted him and then left him with us while she went to college. <laughs> So I love this little Chinese crested. I, this picture was taken, and you can see I'm sitting right behind him with my laptop on my, on my lap. He was on a little blanket on a little hassock. He was dying of cancer. Huge, huge tumor in his gut. And uh, the doctor said, there's nothing we can do. It's too big. It's too involved. And just uh, keep him comfortable. So there was Ducky. I actually, this picture was taken the week that he died, but uh, there he was sitting there in front of me and I was working on my laptop. Ducky got up from that position. He was such a sweet little guy. He got up and he basically said, close your laptop. Well, he didn't, you know, dogs don't talk even though we think they do. Uh, he, he basically got up and uh, he took his little nose right there in front of me and push my laptop closed, this laptop right here. He just snapped it closed. And then he turned around and he uh, went and sat back down on his little ducky and on the hassock in front of me. And I said, oh, ducky, bless your heart. I opened the laptop up and started working again. He got back up again and he walked over and, and he closed the laptop with his nose and then laid on top of this laptop. Pivotal moment. Why are we so busy that we don't focus on the quality of our life while we've got it with the ones we've got it with? Ducky taught me that day, he said, close your laptop, put down your cell phone. The most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. I don't know what that is in your life right now, but for me, you know, we had everything change October the 1st when uh, at home my daughter gave birth to that baby, nine pounds, six ounces, sweet little, perfect little sweet precious girl, nine pounds, six ounces. She's six months old right now. And you know what grandmommy's teaching her? You know what we're good for? Teaching them animal sounds, right? Animal sounds. Let's see how effective I have been teaching this little baby animal sounds. Here we go. Let me see if I can turn it up. See. What sound does the bear make? Isn't that marvelous? I'm doing good. She knows how to do the... She... <laughs> By the way, did you know that like one in five children, babies born are born uh, tongue-tied? Do you guys do the surgery for lasering the little, little tissue tag down there? I saw a fabulous lecture. If you, I know there are a couple of ladies uh, going to be having babies here soon. And uh, I heard a fabulous lecture by a pediatric dentist who uh, talks about how he takes care of that because if, if you're nursing women, this is for women, men, this, you don't care about this, but women, if you're nursing uh, and 
they're biting you, it hurts. There's a high probability that it's because their tongue is tied, and so they are biting you with their ridge, and they can't get the tongue is what you need up there to have the action to nurse. I've learned so much. See, we adopted. I thought that was an easier birthing experience. <laughs> and, uh, but I learned so much. And this little girl, she can take that tongue and almost touch her tongue. She's really got it going on. But anyway, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. Suggestion to you, make memories, not regrets. Make memories, not regrets. Make memories, not regrets. Back to what we started talking about. This is an influence. That whole cycle that I put, put there for you, I want you to think about, you know, what can you do in each one of those spots to influence the, the future, the person you're with? You know, influence you, influence patients, and influence others. What can you do? I've got a question on your handout now. Did, by the way, did you enjoy looking at how everything matters? in that cycle? I hope you did. I sure do hope you did. I've got a question. It's on your handout down there t toward the bottom. It simply says, why do people follow you? Why do people follow you? You know, I am going to assume that you want to be a leader. If you want to be a leader, then people are going to be following you potentially. Uh, and so I want to ask, why do people follow you? Why do people want to follow you? Let's discuss it just a bit. Most of the time we have a copycat society. People literally are following us. They are doing what we do, just following us, and they get into a pattern. Now here's what I've learned about people following people. Sometimes we want to be like them without even questioning what they're doing or where they're going. You know, look at what's going on in politics in the country. I'm just saying. You know, we don't stop and question, what are people doing? What are they thinking? What, you know, what's their motivation? What's behind this story? You know, we don't even question anything. Well, we don't do that in life either. We don't stop and question. Many times we just follow because we want to be like them without questioning where they're going or what they're doing. We just follow. There's research that's been done about this very process uh, with caterpillars. There are... Uh, processionary caterpillars that are out there. And uh, I, I just got them up here on the screen. I'll show you. Pretty interesting little guys. One right after the other, they just keep going. You know what's really fun to do is to put these on the rim of a flower pot. And they will go around and around and around, one behind the other, following each other, not even questioning what the, where, what's the goal, where are we going, what's happening. They just get behind each other until one by one they drop off or drop in or drop out. They die after following, following, following. So why do people follow you? Why do people follow you? Uh, regardless who you are, I'm going to put this up there. I've got it listed down there. Doctors, hygienists, assistants, business team. I want you to think about you, what role you play in the practice, and ask the question, why do people want to follow me? Why? Well, there are reasons why people follow. I don't know uh, if you want to, you can take a picture of this, it's fine with me. I, I don't mind phones being on, just put them on vibrate. You can take a picture of anything on the screen. I meant to mention that earlier this morning. First of all, they have to, that's one reason they do. Or they trust you, you know. Or they like where you're going. That's kind of an interesting reason why people might follow you. They appreciate what you've done. Sometimes it's because they appreciate what you've done for them. It's a personal thing what you've done. They respect who you are, you know, if they uh, happen to get a job and they respect the, uh, the person they're working for, or if they like what they're becoming. And this one I want to share something with you about because I met, uh, met Jim Rohn. He was a professional speaker in the National Speakers Association. I met probably the first year that I went to their convention about 30, 32 years ago. And one of the things that I observed working, you know, listening to Jim Rohn is that he was really serious about the influence that we have. And he made a comment, and I wrote it down. It's been in my notes for a long time. I just, in preparing for this presentation, because this is a, this is a, a new type of topic that I'm presenting now about, you know, how important the influence is that we have on people, patients, and, and others. Uh, I wrote it down, and I want to share it with you. Jim Rohn says that as leaders, let's don't just teach people how to work. Let's teach people how to live. If we'll touch people's lives as well as their skills, if they stay with us a week or a month or a year or a lifetime, 
on whatever occasion they should choose to leave, you want them to leave by saying, and I think I can put this right up on the screen, you want them to leave by saying, my experience there was the greatest experience of my life. And it was, wasn't just what I earned, it was what I learned. How many of you have had a situation where it was, maybe it was just a moment that you met someone and it was life changing because of what you learned in that moment? You know, I seek people out to hear those magical, transform, transformational moments that occurred in their life and how did they handle it? There's a whole network of information out there about the survivor's personality, people who go through stuff and what difference it makes for them. So much to the, so in my opinion, is it important to understand, it's because I go to the university. I'm going down to uh, Augusta. Last month I was down at the University of Texas and I'm walking down the hall and they have a little sign that said something about Student Counseling Center. And I thought, wow, have we gotten to the point in this country that we can't deal with stress and mess? I have worked with doctors who have been through hell and back to bring implant dentistry into the world. And I go in offices where I see doctors who are amazing and being taken for granted. Maybe they're difficult to work with. Maybe they're not very nice. Maybe they just need someone like you who will kind of cover for them, who will be great to work with so that it distracts from this person's like the best surgeon doctor I've ever seen. And uh, it's okay that he spends his time focused on the treatment. I mean, I look at things a very different way. The reality is that, you know, why do people want to follow you? Why do they want to even copy you? Why do they want to be like you? And if they don't, then what can you do to change that if you choose to? I believe there's more value in having you as a part of the team if you can make magic happen in the office with the rest of the team. Use force, that's one way you can make it happen. Use force. Oh, how's that work for you? Use force. In fact, let me give you another little illustration. This is a great one that came, actually came out of that little I Dare You book. Let me give you an illustration. How many of you have ever heard about the, uh, well, wait a minute, let me put the others up. Now, wait, use force, ask for volunteers, offer a challenge, or, or inspire them. These are, these are your options as far as engaging people around you, you know, to uh, better themselves, to improve themselves, to learn, to grow, and to be, you know, be a more valuable member of the team, the family, your life. Uh, you can use force. You can ask for volunteers. Research has proven that people like it when you ask them for volunteers better than they like it when you tell them what to do. Will you do this for me? Will you help me out with this? is more effective than saying, go do this, go do that. This is what research has proven. And there's psychology behind it. The people who explain why they reacted positively to being asked to volunteer to do a project or a task say that when they volunteer, they usually get credit for what they did. If they're just told to do something, they don't get credit. So think about that when you manage the people in your life not just at the office, but at home. You know, are you just barking out orders like I'm guilty of doing? Or are you asking her, hey, will you help me out with this? Could you do me a favor? Could you go get that for me? Would you do that? For me? Would you clean your room? I'll, I'll, I'll come help in a minute. Think about it. Offer a challenge. Now, this is one I respond to personally. You tell me I can't do something, I'm going to lean in and prove you wrong. It's just my nature. I have learned that I have done so many things I could not do that I respond to and want to do things I cannot do by asking simply, what if I could? You know, what if I could do this? What if I could? You know, like, for example, when the doctor came to me and he said, Joy, I, I'm, I'm tired of not getting paid. I would rather not be paid, you know, not treat and not be paid than to treat and not be paid because I can't pay 
the debt associated with, you know, he was a new graduate and he said he had a school loan. He said, I can't pay that. I can't pay the overhead in this practice, the building, the, all the costs. He said, I can't pay. I don't have the money. So, Joy, go out and figure out how to get patients to pay. Well, my background was making payment plans because I had worked for a doctor who sucked nitrous to go to sleep at night. And he would say, don't ask patients for money. I don't want to offend them. And then he would have to borrow to meet payroll. He was very conflicted. And we did have to restrict his privileges, and he did have to relocate after the Dental Society investigated. And, uh, but he is still alive. I check on him periodically. At any rate, you know, the doctor said to me, go figure it out. And all I knew was making what I called non-payment plans. And I thought, well, who gets paid? Who gets paid in medicine? And, of course, plastic surgeons get paid. And when do you pay your plastic surgeon? In advance. In advance. So I asked the plastic surgeons, how do you do that? They didn't tell me how, they told me why, which is a more important answer to get. When you can understand why somebody does something, it's easier to figure out the how-to. They said patients feel guilty for spending so much money so vainly on themselves. And to punish themselves, they don't pay the doctor. And we figured that out years ago. And we figured, well, if, if they're so vain or they want to get this cosmetic stuff done and they want it that bad, they'll figure out how to pay for it. You know, and they'll pay us in advance, we'll do the work. It's our job to tell them what can be done. It's up to them to tell us when it's appropriate for them, them to get it done. And so we just developed that pattern, and pe then it became kind of newsworthy. You always pay your plastic surgeon. So now that's what they do. They know they're gonna, we're, we're not going to extend payment plans. They're going to they're gonna pay. They said, why don't you try it? I said, oh, no, 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 no. We must make financial arrangements according to the patient's ability to pay. And uh, we can't ask patients for money or we'd lose, we'd lose patients. And he said, which patients would you lose? And this was kind of an awakening. We would lose the ones who didn't want to pay. Because people who want to pay, pay you. Have you noticed that? People who want to pay will pay you. People who don't want to pay will figure out a way. He said, you'll lose the ones who don't want to pay. And that will make room for what? People who want to pay. Isn't that fascinating? And then you can choose to do whatever charity work you want to do. But they say, why don't you just try it? You, you tell them what can be done, tell them what the fee is, and ask them how they would like to pay. I did, and before you knew it, I had an accounts receivable in a dental office of 118%. The accountant said, people don't pay you more than what you charge. I said, but if they want to pay me in advance, I go ahead and take it and say, thank you so much. By taking care of the full fee, you make it easy for us to roll out the red carpet every time you come in here. By taking care of the full fee, you make it easy for the doctor to give you the best, best dentistry money can buy. Thank you so much. See, all these things are connected, people. Everything we say, everything we do makes a big difference. So you can use force, ask for volunteers, or offer a challenge. A challenge to me means, you know, I dare you, <laughs> which yeah, I have never liked that language, really, until I found that little book that my dad, that my dad had on his bookshelf, I dare you. Uh, and I started thinking, we can do things even we don't think we can do. First speech I ever gave, the doctor dared me. He said, Joy, you ought to do a table clinic at the big meeting. It was an international meeting. I said, are other staff members doing table clinics? He said, yes, they are. And that was a bold-faced lie. <laughs> I guess he knew if he told me the truth, I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> at any rate, he said, uh, he said, oh, sure, oh, sure, yeah, yeah, you should do it. So I put together a little table clinic about business, all the communication, the financial, the risk management stuff, just a little table clinic about business, and went to the meeting, and there were 50 doctors from all over the world presenting table clinics, and they were all clinical, and I was the only female and the only non-doctor doing a table clinic. So needless to say, I got very sick, violently ill. Oh, I can't do this, I can't do this. Well, you're here now, it's all set up, you know, just do it. There were so many people around my table, maybe out of curiosity, because I was the only female, only non-doctor, and I was skinny and had blonde hair down to my waist. I'm just saying. <laughs> and uh, there were so many people around the table, they moved me uh, into a room, and, and the room filled up, and then they pushed back a wall, and that filled up. My first table clinic was given to 200 people in a room. <laughs> and then two weeks later, I got a letter from the table clinic committee of that association. They said the committee had met and voted me the first place winner of the competition. I didn't even know they had a contest or I'd have really been sick. 
I won. They sent me a gold pen to commemorate, uh, commemorate my winning. This letter is framed above my desk to this day. And then two years later, I found out they didn't have a contest. Somebody made that up. They just saw somebody they thought had talent that had not been discovered yet. And they thought they'd do a little, little, little bit of a boost to their self-esteem to say, you can do this. First dentist I worked for said, Joy, you can do this. <laughs> you know, when I said, I can't, I've never. He said, you can, and today you will. First dentist. Second dentist said, you can't, you can't, you can't. Where's my assistant? And all he would let us do was suck, spit, and blow air. Where's my assistant? You can't, you can't, you can't. I didn't work for him for very long. The third dentist I worked for said, you can, I believe you can. And I proved him right in many things, even though I operated out of fear. Fear is not disabling necessarily. Fear is energizing. I'll talk more about that in a minute. <laughs> These are choices that you have as you're a leader. There was a fable, and here's a fable I'd like to share with you about the, the north wind and the, and the sun. Uh, some of you have heard this fable. I think it's worth sharing again. The north wind and the sun disputed which was the most powerful and agreed that he should be declared the victor who could first strip a wayfaring man of his clothes. The north wind first tried his power and blew with all his might. But the keener became his blast, the closer the traveler wrapped his cloak around him, till at last, resigning all hope of victory, he called upon the sun to see what he could do. The sun suddenly shone out with all his warmth. The traveler no sooner felt his genial rays than he took off one garment after another, and at last, fairly overcome with heat, undressed, and bathed in the stream that lay in his path. Great fable. Point is, persuasion is better than force. If you can inspire people to do the things that they, they can do, maybe they just don't know it yet, what a tremendous difference that may, might make in their future as well as your future. So here's some things. I'm going to put all these things on the screen. If you want to take a picture of this screen, uh, please do. Create a list of things people need to understand and make sure you focus on why they need to understand these things. If you're in a position of leadership, help them succeed. Create a list of things people need to understand and why they need to understand. Focus on one new skill to master at a time and why they need this skill, why it will matter, what difference will it make. Then once mastered, add a new skill. Don't overwhelm people with everything all at once because then they get discouraged. If they mess up one thing because they're trying to do another, they get discouraged and they don't want to show up anymore. Reserve an hour each week for education. Support and encourage creative thinking. And then allow people to learn and execute without fear. I teach risk management. One of the things that I talk about in those risk management programs is doctors, once, I should move out of your way so you can get that picture, go ahead. I say to doctors, doctors, if a staff member is afraid to question what you're doing, like why are you doing this, doc? <laughs> in whatever setting, with the patient, without the patient, if they're afraid to question what, to, what you're doing, they have just stopped learning. If they're afraid of questioning what you're doing, whether it's in relationship with a patient or a treatment plan that you're providing or any, any question about what you're doing, you have, if they're afraid to question you, then you have just entered into the realm of risk because in my experience, working with legal cases like I've had experience working with with doctors, <laughs> if the staff is afraid, they won't tell you important things, doctors, that you need to know. They'll just hold back and let you just bury yourself. And you don't want that to happen. It's not a happy day. So make sure you have a discussion to describe, you know, it, it, I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to ask questions. And here's when we can make that happen. Scheduled time, you know, follow-up time. You know, I noticed you gave me a little look during that procedure. What was going on there? You know, talk to them at the appropriate time after. You know, make sure that there is clear understanding about why these things are important and what they need to learn. 
constantly, constantly help them uh, learn, learn, learn. Then uh, celebrate the development of tomorrow's skills. Celebrate the development of tomorrow's skills. I have a, a colleague in the National Speakers Association by the name of Dan Burris. He's a futurist. He wrote the book Future View. He uh, gets $250,000 for his newsletter, just helping corporations and people all over the world predict the future so they can make business decisions about what to do. And Dan's in the National Speakers Association. He <laughs> gave a presentation to us, and he said, you know, every year I, I, I get the robots and go to a third grade class to speak. When I heard him tell this story, it's like, why would he do that with third graders? He said, oh, it's my best, best audience for looking at the future. He said, I go to the third graders. He said, one year I took, a, took my two robots from the office and two ro robots from my house. He said, I took them and I said, this one at the house, I can tell this robot, go get me a soda. And this robot will actually go into the kitchen, open the refrigerator door, grab a soda, and bring it to me. He said, the only problem is... I have to arrange the refrigerator so the robot knows where to reach to get the soda. And a little third grader raised his hand and said, why don't you put a barcode reader on the robot? <laughs> Brilliant. Kids and what they do and what they can teach you. Amazing. Celebrate the development of tomorrow's skills. When I have a staff meeting in your office, I will ask the doctor, now be quiet, I know you know it all. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know you know it all, but I want to find out what they want to share because when I consult with an office, I send out a questionnaire and it says, if you were the consultant for this practice, what three ideas do you have that need to be implemented? And they'll give me three ideas. Everybody gives me three ideas, things that they know need to be done in the practice. When I go into the practice, I ask them, why are these things not done? I mean, this is a great idea you've got here. Why, why is it not being done? Oh, they don't care about my ideas. Last time I brought up something, I got chewed out. We tried that in 1963, and it didn't work then, and I don't think it's going to work now. So I will seek out the newest employees first, and I will ask them, you know, this is the way they've been doing things. Do you think there's a better way? And these new kids will come up with clever new ideas that are better than what we've done. So celebrate that. Celebrate that the development of tomorrow's skills. Periodically review, re-educate, and create new skills. I have a consulting client in Spokane, Washington who told me, Joy, we got fired up and we took action. She said, we did it, we did it, we did it. And then I noticed a day that we didn't. It's hard to keep your spirit alive, keep your energy up, do the things that you know need to be done, and, and keep that pace up. So there comes a time that you need a refresher. You need a renewal. You need to go away before you come apart. Go on a little staff retreat, whether it's right there in the same building, <laughs> but get together and say, okay, here are the things we agreed we wanted to do, and we're doing this, 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 and this one. We need to, we need to review. Let's, let's get that back on the table. This doctor has training every, every month going over some of the things that they've gone over before so they can all be on the same page in the office. Isn't that valuable information? Absolutely. Periodically review, re-educate, and create new skills. If uh, any of you are trainers and developers, there's a great little book that I can recommend. It's entitled Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor because she is a, a, an animal trainer. And this book is about, if I can get my killer whale to jump through hoops that are on fire, why can't we get people to do what we want them to do? You don't get a killer whale to jump through hoops that's on fire uh, by hitting it verbally or physically <laughs> with a stick. You know, you saw what happened in California when that young lady was training the whale and simply whipped around and her ponytail hit the whale and the whale didn't like it and killed her. So... People may not kill you, but they will want to. And so develop some skills so that you can, you know, people can learn and can grow around you. I love studying leadership. Some of the great books that are written about leadership are written by uh, Maxwell. I don't know if you've ever read any of those 21 uh, Principles of Leadership. I, I forget all the titles of the book, but just look up John Maxwell and leadership books. I love leadership things. I learned about leadership from the dogs. Oh, I just skipped over their picture. But I, I took a dog sled ride in Canada, and uh, as I got on the, on the sled there, uh, on the, you know, to get ready, 
The driver of the sled said, hurry up, the lady, these dogs are ready to go. I said, where are they going? I don't see a path. He said, oh, they've been on the path before. They know where they're going. They see the path. I said, I don't see the path. It's starting to snow. What if they take a wrong turn? He said, don't worry. Uh, you know, and he picked up a hook. He said, I toss it out. I grab hold of a tree rock, and it stops us dead in our tracks. He said, uh, you don't want the dogs going down the wrong path too long, or they'll learn the wrong path. Interesting. I wish I'd have heard that a long time ago when insurance came on board and we all got good at coding, all got good at stopping patients because they've reached their max, all got good at holding patients back and not allowing them to receive care that their insurance didn't cover. I mean, that happens across this country. That's why the average utilization of dental services is 500. They're not even doing what insurance will pay for. This is my favorite definition of leadership. I put it on your handout. It was uh, from Peter Drucker. It says, leadership is the lifting of people's vision to a higher, higher sight, the raising of their performance to a higher standard, the building of their personality beyond its normal limitations. Isn't that a good one? I like that one. Uh, I believe that leaders, developing leaders, equals explosive growth. If you can get more leaders on your team, instead of a leader and a bunch of followers, more things will happen. While followers are standing around waiting to be told what to do, sometimes because they're functioning in fear, while they're standing around waiting to be told what to do, leaders are getting things done. So engage people. Create leaders. Leaders developing leaders equals explosive growth. All right, folks, we're going to turn the page over. Can you believe it? And according to the schedule I see, we've only got 30 minutes to do this page. But this is going to go fast. Is that all right? I am going to have an exercise. So I'm going to need about, oh, five or six people to volunteer in just a minute, in just a minute. But uh, I want you to just wait just a second. Think if, if that's something you might want to do. Just think about it. It will require that uh, you lie down on this floor right up front. So I just want you to get that wrapped around in your head, okay? Give me someone with fire in their heart. I can put what they need in their head. I got that quote from Robert Kriegel. He wrote the book, uh, Sacred Cows Make the Best Burgers. And this came out of, if it ain't broke, break it. It's what we're thinking maybe needs to be changed. You know, what we're doing, maybe we need to change the way we look at things. And I love this. Give me someone with fire in their heart and I can put what they need in their head. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. Fire in your heart. Fire in your heart. How to reignite that fire in the, your heart. How do you do that? I got on the plane. I was really upset. Well, before I got on the plane, I walked into the airport. I was on my way out of town for a nine-day trip. And I had seven days worth of underwear. My staff said, you can buy underwear somewhere else. Don't worry about it. You know, they were trying to encourage me to keep going, keep going, keep going. Nine days was a long trip because I had just come back from another nine-day trip, connecting cities, doing all these speaking dates, and I was tired. My husband has me spoiled rotten. We've been married 32 years. He takes me to the airport. He picks me up. When he picks me up, he's got the dog sitting in the front seat. We lost Ducky, but we got Monkey to replace Ducky. <laughs> Nobody can replace Ducky, but Monkey's trying real hard. Another Chinese crested. He's a hairy hairless. He looks funny. <laughs> funny, funny dog. When he sees me, he goes crazy because he is crazy. <laughs> and he just licks me all over the face. I just love this little enthusiasm. If we just would greet each other that way, wouldn't it make a difference? If we could just act more like a dog, that would be... I, I even told my husband before we got married... I said, I don't want to marry a man unless he can act as excited to see me as my dog does. As soon as he can get those back flips down, we could talk marriage, you know? <laughs> but he meets me at the airport. He's got Ducky in the front seat. I mean, Monkey now in the front seat. He's got a cup of coffee the way I love it sitting in the console. Whoo, I'm spoiled rotten. This particular time, he dropped me off at the airport, and because of security situations, he can't go through security and go to the gate and all that stuff, so it's kind of pointless for him to park and come in. But this particular time, facing a nine-day trip, and I'd just come in from a nine-day trip, just changed out the clothes and, and was ready to go, and, and, and he, 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 I guess he sensed that I was sensitive, and I was not wanting to go. I just didn't want to get on that jet plane and go and go and go for another nine days. And all of a sudden, I'm standing in the security line, 
And there he shows up face to face with me. I said, what's wrong? What happened? What, are you okay? Because what, what, what? I didn't know why he would come in. So don't we, na- don't we naturally sometimes respond negatively instead of saying, you're here. You know what I mean? So anyway, I said, what is it? What, what's wrong? He said, Joy, he said, I know, I know you don't want to go. I know you don't want to leave. He said, but I just want you to remember your purpose. Here's my sweet little husband uh, and my baby girl, the one who just had the baby. Uh, she's very creative. She's a singer-songwriter and uh, travels all over singing. And she's actually educated <laughs> to uh, be a, a, actually a technical designer. She can take your garments and turn them into numbers, send the numbers to China, and all of a sudden a garment will be returned just based on her numbers. Pretty talented. But I love her songs. I love her words. And and there they are. That's my sweet little husband. And he reminded me, remember your purpose. So I want to talk about that right now. My little baby girl was supposed to be at this very site uh, today, in fact. She said, I'm going there. It's Colorado Springs. She's driving across country. She was in Colorado last night. She was going to Colorado Springs. But she serendipitously, is that a word? How do you say it? Serendipitously? Anyway, I think it should be a word if it's not. She... uh, stopped and a family in this town adopted her last night they fed her the baby's with her her killer dog who's with her for protection uh, is with her and uh, they basically said come on in we'd love to have you they had a gift shop an antique shop a Native American shop and they just fell in love with her next thing I know I'm getting all these pictures of her with you know this this older gentleman holding the baby and a younger gentleman playing a violin and Jennifer sitting there with a guitar the ukulele one or the other and they were doing music and she called me last night she said mom I'm going to stay here overnight. I just want to let you know where I am. They're either going to kill me or they're going to become family. (laughs) She loves people. She took this hike, 5,000 steps to the top of this. Any of you ever hiked this this route? You've done this? Yeah. I said, how in the world did you do that? What is it? 5,000 steps, I think she said. How in the world did you do it? How in the world did you do it? She said, Mama, one step at a time. Isn't that amazing? You know, you fulfill your purpose one step at a time, one day at a time, one person at a time. But, you know, a question I have on your handout, too, is why reignite the fire? Why do you need to reignite the fire? I mean, a lot of, I notice it's kind of sad that sometimes we get so busy, so tired, so worn out, it's hard to show up. It, it, it's when you get to the point, it's like, you want to get them, you want me to get them. I mean, that kind of thing. Happens in the office. Okay, this is my last one. Thank God, hallelujah to the Lamb. <laughs> this is it. I'm done. I'm done. I never want to see another patient. Can I introduce you to one of my new best friends? You told me not to do this. You told me not to say your name, even though I ask it, Lois. Come here, Lois. Please, please. Please, will you come here, please, Lois? I want you to meet one of my new best friends. We just met today. Lois, do you mind telling them how old you are? 70. And how long have you worked in dentistry? 28 years. And how often do you quit? Never. Oh, wait. Now, that's not what she said. No. No, we fire each other every Thursday, but we always come back on Monday. And I never asked. Isn't that brilliant? They fire each other every Thursday, and they both come back every Monday. Now, come on, Lois. Thank you, honey. Uh, Isn't that great? Give her a round of applause. You're already crying. Oh, yes. Is this a special relationship? Oh, yeah. They call us the Golden Girls. With all the I love you. And it's Dr. Hensley. Uh-huh. Isn't this wonderful? Isn't that great? Why do you do what you do? Why do you need to reignite the fire? Not fire each other, but. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you need to do that? So you can be like them when you grow up. So you can still have passion to show up. So you can make a difference because it makes a difference. 
so you can be that spark, that whatever. Okay, so let me just give you some fill in the blanks and we'll finish this up today. You will be more motivated, which means if you, you know, reignite the fire, here's why, you will be more motivated, which means you're interested and enthusiastic. You show up even when you don't feel like it, you just get in there and you do it because it matters. You will be more resilient if you reignite the fire, which means you will recover more quickly. When you get knocked down, you'll spring right back. You'll show up. I had a dental a receptionist that came to work for me, and, and I hired, it for, hired her originally because she showed up, literally. She was standing at the front desk, and she showed up, and she said, I'm getting married. She was a delivery person for the laboratory. She said, I'm getting married, and I need a full-time job. Do you know anybody who's hiring? This was a gal who would show up. She could roll her car over three times on the way to the office, and when she walked in the door, she would say, Whoo, that was a close one. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't always act like that. I would have to fake it and act like I was a joy, which is better than being a real sore, sore head, but she was authentic, and, and so I said, I'd love to hire you. I want you to go to work here, and, and she said, oh, that would be my dream job. I said, obviously, you've never worked in a dental office, <laughs> but then I watched her, and she was magical. She was amazing. She would show up even when she was injured. She came into the office one day and had a tubal pregnancy. She was bent over double, but she showed up. She said, well, you guys need me. <laughs> and I said, no, we're going to take care of you. You know, but she showed up. My rule of hiring is, will they show up? Number two, will they act like they're happy to be there in their own special way? <laughs> you know, will they show up and act like they're happy to be there? You will recover more quickly if you reignite the fire in your heart. You know, you will be more resourceful, and this is what I really want to look for. You have the ability to find quick and clever ways to overcome difficulties. I watched Suzette, one of my favorite dental assistants, assisting when we had a theater for education. Doctors from all over the world coming in to watch us do surgery. And uh, Suzette was assisting, and the compressor shut down. The suction was not working. Suzette didn't miss a beat. She grabbed some cotton forceps and some two-by-twos. She went in the mouth and went... <laughs> I said, Suzette, I said, that was hysterical. <laughs> Why did you do that? She said, because these dentists lose their mind if something goes wrong. <laughs> and they need to learn to keep going because stuff is going to go wrong. You know, keep, stay in there. Keep your nose to it. It'll be okay. You'll learn at least from this. You know, she was amazing, unbelievable. She's also the one I said that, you know, cleverly came up with, you know, going and shutting off the compressor so the doctor wouldn't proceed doing treatment without financial arrangements. You know, this is why you need to, uh, you know, reignite the fire. What is the enemy of a fire? What is the enemy of a fire? It's a very simple question. A fire hose <laughs> is the enemy of a fire. And here's what I run into. We have somebody come in the office and they're not normal, kind of get excited like I do, and somebody's there saying, would you calm down? <laughs> would you chill out? I mean, would you just kind of get it together? We're professionals here. <laughs> would you calm down? You're making us look bad. Stop being so happy. You know, and there's a time and a place to do things like I do because I believe that if you don't have joy in your practice, you're really backing up, literally. <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> I mean it. If you don't have joy, you're going to suffer. You're going to be brittle, brittle. You're going to get bitter. You're going to start hating this job. And I see it because I do consulting. Last year prevented two suicides. I mean prevented it with God's help because I can't do anything. But God helped me because I got a call from a doctor who said I'm going to kill myself. I said, no, 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 you're not. That's a fabulous practice, well-known doctor. He said, I'm done. I've had it. His life was falling apart. I said, no, no, no. I said, can you hold it together till Thanksgiving? He said, he said why? He said, because my, I, and I told him, I said, my family can cook a turkey. <laughs> I'm, coming, I'm coming to your office. We're going to spend Thanksgiving together. We're going to figure out this deal because I know it's not you. It's, it's got to be all the other mess and stress that you, you know, I, I'll help you with that. You know, no, you're not going to kill yourself. The fact of the matter is stuff happens and we just kind of get to the end and there's nobody around us to encourage us. Instead, they discourage us. 
They criticize us. They pick us all apart. And I've done it, so I can talk about this. I went to the doctor one day. I told her 23 times how to do this. She still doesn't get it. <laughs> you know, and then there I, there I am doing the job myself because I get rid of them. And then I had to figure out, maybe I need to be a better leader. Maybe I need to help these people better. I love this quote from Einstein. I think he's pretty smart. I love it. He said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. Isn't that a good one? The reality is there are always going to be people who are going to try to kill your spirit, steal your joy. Don't let that happen. You know, hang in there. And understand, if they were on top of the world, they would want to pull you up there with them. But because they're kind of down here, they're not, you know, they've got, you know, they're not nice, something is not right. Because if they were on top of the world, they'd pull you up there with them. If they're not being nice, they must have problems bigger than your problems. Or at least they can't handle their problems. Maybe that's the case. And maybe because you're an expert, because you've been through some stuff, and you survived, and you chose to lean into the wind and, and, and bring it through, you know, things happen. I have courage. Have courage. Even though there might be some turkeys on the road in front of you. I took that picture in Peoria, Illinois. You know, there might be turkeys on the road in front of you, but some of the turkeys that we bring into our lives ourselves because we are always comparing ourselves to everyone else. Be careful about that. I still do that sort of thing. Well, why am I not speaking at that meeting, I will say, because I'll see who's on the program, and I'll think, well, I can do better than that, and I'm not on that meeting. You know why? Because years ago I said, God, open doors you want to open for me, and slam shut the ones you want to slam shut. That's what, now I've gone to preaching, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Woo! You have the ability to, to, to motivate people toward positive change. And when you get it right, there's a magic and a momentum that will happen. <laughs> you will stimulate their minds, stir their hearts, uplift their spirits, and nourish their souls. Your power to influence is phenomenal. And when all is said and done, you will have made a difference, and lives will be changed, beginning with your own. I put that in your handout. I feel so strongly about it. So now let's get to work. I need to ask you, you know, how do you fuel the fire? What can you do to make a difference? How can you move things forward in your life and fuel the fire so you don't burn out? By the way, is it burnout or is it exhaustion? Burnout's when you just don't want to do it. Exhaustion is when you want to do it, but you're just tired. Stop. Be still. Rest. Take care of yourself because we need you. We need you to show up. We need you to act like you're happy to be there. You know, you want to fuel the fire. How do you do it exactly? That was pretty cool, wasn't it? <laughs> Did you like that? Anybody want to see that again? I do too. I like that. I like that. That's pretty cool the way that works. Watch. There it goes. <laughs> Isn't that neat? I love it. Some of the stuff I do just for me, because that was just too fun, you know? Fuel the fire, fuel the fire. First of all, number one, write down your health. If you're not healthy, you don't have energy, it's, it's gonna be hard. Get healthy, I just lost 15 pounds. You know how I did it? Quit eating sugar. Found out sugar's a cancer feeder. I don't have cancer. Well, I, I did, but then they biopsied it and it was a freckle. <laughs> Uh, it may have been cancer, but I had friends praying. So anyway, may, I don't know. It was a freckle. That's pretty cool. So I've got a scar for the freckle that was removed. Isn't that fun? Anyway, health. You've got to be healthy. You've got to have optimism. Optimism. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. You know, I don't know if you know who this person is. I want to put his picture up here. Uh, this guy right here, Mike Powell. Oh, I was going to get five people to volunteer up here. Let me just do something. I won't do that because we're going to run out of time and you guys might want to leave. I don't know that that's the case. May I ask you to volunteer? Please, will you help me? You've been such a great little prop. I've talked to you all day. <laughs> what is your name? Kim. Do you mind? Can you pull the end of this thing out? Come here with me. Come on, I want us, I want us to show somebody something. Okay, if you will. Okay, if you will, let me see. Let's go in that direction. Okay, you pull it out. You've got the end of it. I'm going to look, the, look at the... Wait a second. Let me see. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, stop, let me look. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. 
Okay, keep going. Keep going, keep going. Whoa, 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 slow, 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 slow down. Right. Right here. Okay, wait, right there, right there. Stay right where you are. We can set this on the floor. We can set that right there. Uh, may I ask you to volunteer? Yes, you're the one I'm pointing to who just looked behind you. <laughs> yes, that one. That one. Now, I'm going to... You know what? We might need to pull back just a little bit because I don't want him to hit the wall. Uh, let's just pull back just a little bit. That's right here. Right, right, right here. That's good. You stand right there at the end. You stay right there at the end so we can see where he's supposed to land. And you see where I'm standing. Yeah. What I'd like you to do is get a running start over there and then just kind of like take off here and jump over there. You think you can do that? No. <laughs> All right, well, do me a favor then. I want you to stand here as my marker. Okay. Uh, this is where I was gonna have people lie on the floor, but we've run out of time. Let me read something to you. This is totally, totally wonderful and cool. Listen to this. He would sit all alone in his living room, often for hours at a time, waiting until the daylight had drained out of the walls and the room was cool and dark. That way could, he could see the dream better as if it were a movie whose image fades in light. When the hairs finally began to stand up on the back of his neck, Mike Powell would walk slowly to the back of the house, turn and wait until he could see it squarely in front of him. He would come bounding out of the TV room, turn left after he passed through the foyer, and make another sharp left as he entered the living room. By the time I got to the dining room, I would jump and I would, make, and I would visualize myself breaking the world record, Powell says. Of course, this became more complicated after he bought a dining room table a few months ago. <laughs> sometimes he would break the world record and sometimes he would break the world record and a salad plate. <laughs> the record was Bob Beeman's long jump mark of 29 feet, two and a half inches set during the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City, and for merely a, nearly a quarter of a century shrouded in the thin air and heavy breathing of incense and mythology. This writer's amazing. To break such a record would require from a man a perfect leap of faith. Sometimes I would just be sitting there on the couch, and all of a sudden, here came Mike, said Karen, Powell's girlfriend of three years. He would come running through the living room, take off, and then in a minute, the minute he landed, he threw his hands in the air and started jumping around up and down. He always broke the world record every time. Powell never deprived himself of the elation that that moment would bring. I could actually feel the rush in my head, he said. I have imagined that moment in my mind 100 times. Maybe you saw Mike Powell make that leap in 1991 before some of you were born. <laughs> but did you picture it being 29 feet, four and a half inches? Can you believe that? From where I'm standing to where, you know, from here to there, that's what 29 feet, four and a half inches looks like in a single bound. And according to the articles and the research I recently did, uh, that record has never been broken. 1991, he did it, 29 feet, four and a half inches. Thank you so much. Thanks for your help. Thanks for illustrating. Thank you, thank you. You sure you don't want to try? Push the button, it's pretty magical. It's cool, it's pretty neat. There it is, here to go. Don't cut your fingers, you need those. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Wasn't that awesome? So, hey, have some optimism. Have some optimism. You know you can, you can, you can. So you got health, you've got optimism. How about talent? My daddy told me if you've got talent, you ought to use it. You know what my husband told me when we got married 32 years ago? If you've got talent, oh, that's number three, talent. If you've got talent, you ought to use it full time. Are you doing that? Are you using your talent full time? And are you recognize that people around you have talent, they just haven't tapped into it, didn't know they had it yet? Use your talent, talent. Oh, here's another one for you, courage. 
Courage, you want to have some courage because courage is kind of tough to find sometimes. You just don't know exactly whether you can do this or not, but lean into it. Have courage, have courage. Another one is hunger. Hunger, you got to want to. If you don't want to, how in the world can you possibly do the things that you, that you can do if you just simply don't want to? And want to bad enough that you're willing to do, to learn, to study, to read, to, you know, to get better, to ask questions, to maybe even act like you're bugging someone because you want to learn to do it as well as they do it. You know, ask questions, don't interfere with them, but ask questions and say, will you help me out with this? You know, I really want to learn. I don't want to mess up. Thank you so much for helping me. Get engaged. Have a hunger. And then have a perspective. Perspective to me is kind of a critical deal as far as I'm concerned. Uh, perspective has been taught to me by a lot of different people, and I'm pulling some, some, something I want to share with you, something else. Uh, perspective was taught to me by one of my dear friends, Nancy, at her funeral. I got the phone call. She had passed away. Nancy was someone I only met casually one time. And then she invited me over to her house when I was in the middle of a crisis. She had experienced a crisis before in her life. How many of you done that, have done that, experienced a crisis? And she invited me over. She thought maybe she could help the kid uh, live through a crisis in my life, and she did. I was very sad to hear about her passing, but I went to the funeral, and her son, Adam, spoke at the funeral. One of the neatest things that he did is as he stood up there, he said, he said you know, my mom was really pretty cool, especially when she was in hospice. And I was curious, what's he going to say about this? He said the whole family was gathered around her, and, and uh, they had told us it was just a matter of, of, of time, really hours. And he said all of a sudden, he said, my mother said, leave, leave, you must leave, get out, get out, get out. And, and they said, no, 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 we don't want to leave. You must leave, she said. So they left the room. They were all out in the hall wondering what in the world's going on in there. And about 30 minutes went by, Adam opened the door, peeked in. His mother was peacefully lying in the bed, and he didn't see any movement. So he rushed over, and he shook her. He said, Mom, Mom, Mom. And, and she just simply spoke, and she said, Do you see it? Do you see it? He thought, of course, she was talking about the light, you know, that people see. She was experiencing this transformation or something. And, and he, he said, No, Mom, what, what, what do you see? What do you see, Mom? She said, Embrace the diaper. My friend Nancy was a classy dresser, very involved politically in our city, was very, very visible in our city. Lots of people knew Nancy, and those who knew her loved her. Nancy was very active in the community. She was always helping someone, and uh, she was a classy, fine dresser. At this very moment, she was adorned with a diaper. Not her choice, not her favorite. She was not excited about being in a diaper. But she had asked the crowd to leave because she needed to use the diaper. And she just couldn't do it with them in the room. So it was for their protection that she asked them to leave. And then she said, embrace the diaper. Sometimes stuff happens, and you may not like it at the time, but embrace it. Maybe change your perspective about how you use it to learn, to grow, embrace the diaper. I do this all the time in, a in airports. <laughs> Midway, I walk in, it's backed up like that. They tell me I've got an eight-hour delay. I'm not real happy. I'm not real happy. And then I meet somebody like Milton, who took his lunch hour after I went through TSA, after I passed through and he was a TSA checkpoint person. He took his lunch hour, and I was begging for a table to sit down. The tables were all full. Milton was sitting. I didn't see him then, but I finally guilted somebody into getting up so I could eat some lunch and sat down, and, and I heard this singing. I looked up. It was Milton. He was singing right a few, few feet away from me. We made eye contact with that. He picked up his tray and came over to my table. <laughs> eye contact. It's amazing how that works to move people. He sat at my table, and I said, Oh, don't stop singing. I love your singing. He said, I sing all the time. It's good for my spirit. And for the next 30 minutes, he shared the story of his life, and it changed me. Isn't it amazing that a casual acquaintance can change the current of an otherwise frustrating day? Be that with your patience. Be that with each other. A couple more tips for you here. You've got the health, you've got optimism, talent, you've got courage, 
hunger, perspective. Another one, let's get back to the purpose. Why are you here? I, 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 I always ask that question. I'm wondering why do people show up? So I've got a gift for you. In your bag, there's a little small round mirror. Would you find it for me? A little small round mirror, would you hold that? I've got that gift and one other, and then we'll, then we'll go. Have you enjoyed today? Thank you so much. Folks, just grab that little mirror and let me read something for you. Let me just tell you something that happened. Alexander Papaderos was teaching a class at the island of Crete. The history of Alexander Papaderos is that he was a survivor of the war, but he did live in a concentration camp. When he was just a four-year-old child, Hitler sent troops over to the island of Crete, and uh, they attacked, they killed, they slaughtered uh, the villagers in that village. But he was hiding. He was just a child. He was hiding, and he survived. The villagers that remained, they, they came out. The next time Hitler came and they with pitchforks and machetes, they killed all of Hitler's troops. Hitler didn't like that much, so he sent more back to slaughter, to kill, to, to uh, you know, destroy the village. Alexander Papadero still, still survived even though he went to a concentration camp. He still even survived that. Then he opened an institute on the island of Crete where he taught. An interesting thing happened, uh, an author of uh, books that some of you may have, have seen, it was on fire when I laid down on it, one, uh-oh, is another by Robert Fulcrum, little short stories of real life events. I, I found a little story, and there was a story about Alexander Papaderos and how Robert Fulcrum would go to seminars like this. At the seminars, he, he always would notice the professor would say, what questions do you have? Are there any questions at the end of the, end of the course? And Robert Fulcrum was, uh, you know, one that wanted to participate, so he said, I'll come up with a question that if I can get the answer, it might just be life-changing for me. It would be really good to have the answer. So the question that he asked is, what is the meaning of life? Usually when he would ask that question, people in the, in the class would start chuckling, ha <laughs> ha, and gathering their things to leave. But he decided to ask it anyway, just in case someone might know. He took a class at the island of Crete taught by Alexander Papaderos. It was a two-week class talking about how to get along with people, how not to hate, how to love, and so on. And at the end of the two weeks, the professor got up from his chair and he walked to the front of the class and he asked, what questions do you have? Do you have any questions? No one raised their hand. But then Ale uh, Robert Fulcrum raised his hand at the back of the room and looked at Dr. Papaderos and said, yes, Dr. Papaderos, what is the meaning of life? Dr. Papaderos looked at him and seeing that he was serious with his question, not just joking around, he reached in his pocket, he pulled out his wallet, and he grabbed a small round mirror about the same size of this, this one you have, about the size of a quarter. And I'd like to share with you what he said. He said, when I was a small child during the war, we were very poor and we lived in a remote village. One day on the road, I found the broken pieces of a mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. I tried to find all the pieces and put, the get, put them together, but it was impossible. So I kept only the largest piece, this one, and by scratching it on the stone, I made it round. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark places where the sun would never shine. In deep holes and crevices, crevices, in dark closets, it became a game for me to get the light into the most inaccessible places I could find. I kept the little mirror, and as I went about my growing up, I would take it out in idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this is not just a game, not just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light or the source of light, but light Truth, understanding, knowledge is there. And it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the black places and the hearts of men, and change some things in some people. Perhaps others may see and do likewise. This is what I am about. This is the meaning of life. Fulcrum says, he then took the small mirror and holding it carefully, caught the bright rays of daylight, 
streaming through the window and reflected them onto my face and onto my hands folded on the desk that day. Much of what I experienced in the way of information about Greek culture and history that summer is gone from memory. But in the wallet of my mind, I carry a small round mirror still. Are there any questions? Isn't that a great story? I gave you one of these to put in your wallet just to be reminded <laughs> you have a purpose that goes way beyond what you ever imagined or dreamed of, and I surely hope that you will use it. There's one more gift in your bag. Some of you have heard me before. You know I love to give these away because I am, I am certainly aware that some of you are going through something right now, and I want to encourage you. You can survive this, whatever happens. And uh, during 9-11, I was struck by the fact that my mother couldn't remember me. She had Alzheimer's, but she could remember her favorite promise. My sweet little mother is a Southern Christian woman. She would make my mean brothers and I get up every morning for breakfast. And as we would gather around the table, she would say, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And then she would instruct us, get you a promise. In the middle of the table was a box with brightly colored cards. They were scriptures. She would make us pull one out. There wasn't a negative word in the box. We would pull one out of the box, and as we would go around the table, she would make us read ours. And as we would read ours, she would pour, point her little finger at us and say, now that's a good one. Think on that all day. It was a setup. <laughs> she did that on purpose. She wanted to affect our thoughts because she knew without knowing that we would go through stuff and she didn't want us to be afraid. Her favorite promise I had printed on the Spanish on one side, English on the other when 9-11 took place because everywhere I go, every time there's a plane crash or an engine blows up, I get on the plane and everybody's gripping the armrest and oh, they hear the wheels come up. What happened? What was that? And I like to encourage them. I also want to encourage you. My mother's favorite promise was apparently God encouraging Isaiah. He said, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So I brought these. I'm going to, well, you've got them in your bag. We put one in every one of your bags. If you don't want it, please give it to somebody else because people need to be encouraged. I love you. Thank you. I've got more if any of you want any more of them. Thank you, guys. I love you so much.